committee will come to order. And we welcome uh, all the committee members, all the new members. Um, this is the first uh, kind of official meeting of the committee, and uh, we appreciate you all being here. Appreciate the secretary uh, uh, being willing to uh, join us. Uh, we've got plenty of ground to cover today, and I'm sure there'll be all kinds of questions that I'm glad you have to answer and not me, okay? Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, I look forward to hearing your outlook on the farm economy in the coming year, your take on the implementation of the Farm Bill, an update on the overall health of the department, and any other thoughts that you'd like to share with us. Uh, but for, before uh, we move on, I'd, I'd like to take a second to talk about uh, money. Your visits uh, to the committee over the last two years have come roughly at the same time that the White House has called for, have, has called for billions of dollars of cuts in USDA programs. So this year, it appears, is no different. Uh, just this week, the White House called for a 5% cut to non-defense spending. And while this is concerning on its own, it's uh, compounded by your comments that this number may potentially be as high as 10% or higher. So that worries me a lot. And uh, given the broad range of challenges that we're confronting as farmers, ranchers, rural communities, and working families, uh, you know, we, we're concerned about that. So, uh, Mr. Secretary, it's, you know, as you know, things have not gotten any better in farm country. And uh, so whatever you can tell us about uh, where that process is at, uh, I have no doubt that you're on our side, that you are concerned about our uh, farmers and ranchers, but uh, you have a role to play. We understand that. So I just like uh, your take on things. And as these incomes uh, continue to be down or the prices continue to be down and continue to decline, the uh, Wins on the trade, which I hope are going to happen, have not materialized. Uh, the bankers are telling me that they're not going to be financing some people. So we're just concerned about where we're heading. And uh, whatever you can uh, uh, tell us in that regard will be helpful. Uh, when it comes uh, to the Farm Bill, the, the main thing uh, that I have been focusing on is the dairy provisions. Uh, you know, I'm very proud of the what we were able to do in the Farm Bill for dairy and thank the former chairman for his help with that and the other committee members. Uh, what I'm concerned about is, you know, the, peop the dairy people were so soured <laughs> on the old program that it's difficult to get them to look at the new program. And we've got a couple of dairy farmers in our part of the world going out of business every week or every month. And what I'm worried about is that we get the message out to these people that this is a different world that we're facing with this new provisions in the Farm Bill. And I've had some people tell me that the safety net we put in there is actually too good uh, because you're going to have 950 above feed cost, which is 1750 milk that you can get for a pretty reasonable price. So uh, I'm doing what I can to get this message out. I've been uh, talking to the co-ops, talking to the uh, farm press like horse dairymen and so forth to get the word out to dairy farmers that if you're thinking about pulling the plug, give us a couple months till we can roll out this program before you make a decision. Because I think if you look at what's in this bill, that will change your mind. And you know, and I think uh, the pray, the future for dairy is actually pretty good given this new um, uh, safety net. So whatever the department can do to help us with that message. Um, as I understand it, it's gonna be probably early summer before you get these regulations written, uh, but they will be retroactive, as I understand it, till the first of the year. Uh, we have some information for any of you on the committee that show what you would have gotten last year if this program would have been in effect in uh, 2018. Uh, if you have five million pounds of milk and you signed up for the whole thing at 950, it would have cost you about five grand to get almost $100,000 worth of, of benefit if the program would have been in place last year. So I just hope that we can all talk to our dairy farmers and, and make sure that they factor that in before they go off and make a decision that's going to be irreversible. Because the, when we lose these dairy folks, it's hard to replace. It's hard to get the expertise and the uh, what it takes to learn how to be a dairy farmer back into place. 
The Farm Bill also provides resources to small communities for broadband, and uh, we hope that that will be focused on people that don't have broadband and not overbuild existing systems like we've done over the last number of years. Uh, there's been help for mental health and uh, substance abuse, which are problems in rural areas. Uh, and what, uh, as I said, doesn't help would be to take an indiscriminate whack at this funding. And so I know you're on our side. I uh, will do whatever we can to help convince the administration that this is not a good idea. And we'll see where that all goes. So uh, it's my hope that um, you have good news to share with us today uh, and that there's some blue sky amongst the clouds that I've um, mentioned. And uh, the thing about it is you've always given us to us straight. And I expect that uh, you're going to do that again today. You've always been a de fierce defender of the programs at USDA. And we appreciate that. And we look forward to your comments. Um, and uh, with that, I recognize the distinguished uh, ranking member, former chairman of the committee from Texas, uh, Mr. Conaway. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate you uh, convening this important hearing this morning on the uh, state of the farm, farm economy. Mr. Secretary, welcome back. Uh, thank you for being here with us as well. Uh, earlier, during consideration of the committee's budget and views uh, estimates letter, I commented on the extremely difficult conditions in farm and ranch country. As I said then, I wish we could have strengthened the farm safety net more in the Farm Bill, but folks in the other body had different ideas about what to spend money on. In any event, worsening conditions certainly warrant our close attention. Sure. Sure. Thankfully, there are some things we can do right now to improve conditions in rural America and farm and ranch country. And Mr. Secretary, I believe that you're at the tip of the spear uh, on this front. You ably defended the critical market access for our farmers and ranchers gained under NAFTA while, uh, while the agreement was improved upon under the USMCA. If we truly want uh, to help our, uh, United, our nation's farmers and ranchers the and the entire U.S. economy, moving USMCA should be a priority of every member of Congress. Mr. Secretary, I know you're also working hard to ensure there is a successful resolution very soon to the ongoing trade dispute with China, a resolution that will help level the playing field for the United States and require China to live by the same rules that we do. During this process, I greatly appreciate the initiative you took to provide farmers and ranchers the market facilitation program to help them weather the unjustified retaliatory tariffs that have been imposed. And Mr. Secretary, I'm behind you and the administration in your efforts to unwind all the arbitrary and costly regulatory burdens that have been heaped upon our nation's farmers and ranchers, including the current, including the prior administration's Waters of the U.S. regulation and its climate change regs. Expanding markets, regulatory reef, relief, and a strong safety net are three essential ingredients to help to a healthy and vibrant rural America, and you, Mr. Secretary, have worked hard to ensure on all three. I'm looking forward to visiting with you further at this hearing and offline about how we can improve the lives of those who feed and clothe our nation and the lives of all rural Americans. Our farmers and ranchers and rural Americans are still the backbone of our country, and if we keep them strong, they will also, uh, we'll also have a much stronger country. Mr. Secretary, I know you and I share this conviction. I'm grateful for you all that you do. I look forward to your testimony, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> uh, I just want to notify the, the members that uh, you're going to be put in order by uh, uh, seniority uh, based on the fact that you were here when the gavel was uh, struck. And anybody that comes in uh, later will be put down the list. And you will keep your place if you have to. I know there's a whole bunch of committees going on and all that. If you have to step out, as long as you get back here in time to keep your place, you'll keep your place in, in line. And so we'll try to work this um, in an orderly fashion and make sure everybody has a chance to uh, weigh in. So, Mr. Secretary, uh, again, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. We appreciate it. Uh, we know you got a tough job. And, uh, you know, I was in dealing with some of your Georgia constituents uh, this last week, and they're, I know they're having a very tough time, and uh, so uh, we appreciate what you do, and uh, we want to be supportive and helpful uh, with USDA to complete their mission. So um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A good partnership with this committee, as well as uh, uh, your members. Uh, I come willingly. Uh, I thought it was better than being subpoenaed, but uh, uh, nonetheless, you uh, you stated the obvious. Uh, 
The farm economy, and coming to speak about the farm economy, we know it's tough out there. And uh, you mentioned one sector, certainly, that uh, probably has been under more duress than uh, most any. That's the dairy industry, and we'll talk more about that later on. I think uh, if they can hold on, helps on the way, thanks to the farm bill. So uh, we know that the uh, farm income has fallen about 50 percent over the last five years. There are very few businesses that can su survive that kind of revenue decrease. Uh, that's from 2000, probably the peak in 2013. Uh, most commodity prices have fallen, while global stock levels, due to good growing seasons around the world, primarily in other places, have rebounded with several years of record production. Uh, working capital, uh, farmers, just like any other business, depend on working capital to fund their operations and uh, has decreased by 70% since 2012. Farm debt's been rising more rapidly over the last five years, increasing by 30 percent since 2013. Uh, but fortunately, we're not to the levels of uh, the early 80s. And I don't think we'll get there, but uh, what you all have done in this farm bill and previous farm bills, I think, has uh, been a great safety net with crop insurance uh, primarily that uh, enable our farmers to do, be better risk managers. Uh, certainly, uh, I think one indication of that is relatively firm land values have uh, kept farmer debt to asset levels uh, relatively low by historical standards and certainly our low interest rates over the last period of number of years have, uh, have helped as well. So we are projecting, USDA and our economists are projecting a net farm income of $77.6 billion. Uh, that is a, an increase from last year, not including the market facilitation program. Uh, but it remains to be seen in farming. As you well know, it's never over till it's the, the crops in the bins and the checks in the bank. So uh, many things can happen, as we saw in 17 and 18 regarding uh, disasters. The current state of the rural economy, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, leaves many producers vulnerable to market disruptions, including illegal retaliatory tariffs and disasters, as we said. Overall, I think the new Farm Bill uh, fulfills the primary goal of farm programs, helping farmers, ranchers uh, manage risk and continue to producing food, fiber, fuel uh, in good years as well as bad, as well as uh, uh, taking care of our consumers and safety, food safety in many ways as well. Uh, we were honored to participate in the uh, deliberation of the Farm Bill last year. I was very proud of our team in providing over 2,000 items of technical assistance, both to uh, majority and minority in that area, both Senate and House, and uh, uh, we believe that you all gave a good product in the end of the day, and we're eager to implement that farm bill. Uh, our Deputy Secretary, Steve Sinsky, is already leading those implementation efforts. We had been since the beginning, even prior to the signing, as we knew uh, I had some heads up about some of the provisions there. Uh, we actually continued during the shutdown, although in a more limited basis during that period of time. And uh, so we are uh, following a process similar to one that USDA put in place uh, uh, to implement the 2014 Farm Bill. Uh, our Farm Bill Implementation Group formally met on the December the 20th, and as the signing of the bill, the enactment and catalog provisions requiring action, assign them to responsible agencies, and finalize timelines for implementation. We are also have already begun and are, are getting stakeholder input on how best to implement the provisions. Just on Tuesday, yesterday, we uh, our FPAC uh, uh, Production and Conservation Group held a public listening session. I think over 600 people were there and present, and uh, many others joined by the Internet. So... Uh, these formal and informal listing sessions will continue. So although not under the direct jurisdiction of the Ag Committee, these are the top three legislative issues that farmers continue to raise with me as I travel, certainly are trade. I think we'll have some discussion about that today. Uh, uh, labor, uh, a legal farm workforce. Labor is becoming more and more difficult uh, to attract in most all areas of the country. I don't hear of any... Uh, any people that are flush with uh, ag labor in that regard. Uh, regulation, as a ranking member mentioned, uh, we're continuing to work on uh, regulations to keep it safe but make it productive 
And the fourth thing that we hear more about now, certainly in certain regions of the country, from California uh, to Florida, the Carolinas to Georgia, are the disaster programs. So in conclusion, over the past two years, as I've traveled across the country, in fact, uh, been to 48 states since May of 17, uh, and we'll finish up the, that last two this year. Here directly from the people we serve, it's important for us to get out among them and to look them in the eye and to hear directly from them. So I'm proud of the great strides that the good men and women of USDA are making. I found them to be a, uh, an honorable, hardworking workforce when we got there. Uh, our goal and our mantra that drives us each and every day is to be the most effective, the most efficient, the most customer-focused agency in the federal government. So as we work to implement the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, we want to keep in mind our motto that uh, we think drives us in all that we do, and that's to do right and feed everyone. So thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to discussions with uh, your members. Now, thank you, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate that. And with that, I'll uh, recognize myself for a couple of questions. Uh, um, I had talked to you, um, I don't know, a month ago or so about this Asian swine fever situation in China. And uh, my constituents are still very concerned about this, um, that uh, they might, <laughs> they're worried about grandmothers bringing meat in from uh, China. Uh, and has, has there been any uh, significant upgrade at uh, the airports uh, with these flights that are coming in from mainland China uh, to, to make sure that we don't have this potential swine fle uh, fever coming in? As far as I understand it, it's decimated the uh, hog industry in China. If this gets into the United States, it's going to put us out of business. So I'd, are, we, um, are we on the ball here? Well, I think we are, but there's no doubt in these kind of transmissible diseases and the mobility of society today, uh, there's no way to guarantee that, Mr. Chairman. But I think uh, APHIS, uh, our Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, is on the job at borders. Uh, working hand in glove with our Customs Border Patrol, uh, using uh, obviously uh, uh, dogs, uh, rescue beagles in order to uh, sniff out incoming uh, 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 travelers from internationally, particularly in those areas that uh, we fear. But uh, the uh, uh, the pest uh, transmission, both of uh, animal and plant, is a real uh, concern always. We're ever vigilant about that. We feel that we've got a good uh, uh, protocol in place. We're working both with our uh, primary threats, although there are no e uh, evidence of African swine fever in Canada or Mexico. You know that we both enjoy very long borders and fairly porous borders with each, and uh, that, that's a concern. So we work with those countries. We are going to Ottawa in the end of May to, again, Co collaborate on our protocols, making sure that we're all aware and doing the same thing. Awareness is the first key, but uh, inspection and checking and uh, is second. I think we're doing that. Uh, something like this is just no way to uh, guarantee, but I believe we're doing everything possible at this time uh, to do, be as preventive as possible in a very devastating disease. Uh, it's the mobility of our swine population in the United States, as you well know from your area, many of these uh, pigs are, are born elsewhere and they're transferred to be fed out in other parts of the country. And uh, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of pigs on the road at any given time, which makes it very difficult, unlike uh, maybe a regionalization or a concept in poultry where you can more identify and, and encapsulate uh, the mobility of our, our pig population makes that more difficult. But I believe we're doing everything we can. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, whatever we can do to, to help, we're, we're there. Uh, you were last weekend, I guess, at Pheasant Fest in Illinois. Am I right? I was in Chicago and, last Saturday. <laughs> so uh, I guess you indicated that you're going to uh, hope to reopen the CRP sign up by the end of the summer. Uh, is that just the continuous, or does that include a general sign-up? We will begin with the continuous. If I can refer to notes, I've got some notes about when we expect those uh, deadlines of those, uh, uh, those to begin. Uh, the, the answer to the question is, uh, you well know, and uh, these regulations on top of all the things we do are uh, 
based on how we have uh, uh, wrapped ourselves in a lot of uh, checks and balances in this world uh, is very uh, difficult and onerous many times to get through. We expect the, uh, all of the uh, CRP pieces on the general sign-up to be uh, around December the 1st. I think we'll probably be uh, sooner, uh, available sooner than that by in continuous in that way. I know that's an interest of yours, and uh, I think the things you've done with uh, uh, the whole field and uh, uh, Senator Thune's com uh, contribution over the short-term uh, prospects make uh, a real purpose of CRP from uh, uh, producing on the healthy lands and keeping these fragile lands for uh, uh, passive fallow with the wildlife growth and others will be helpful. Well, we hope so, and uh, we'll have to see how this plays out. But, I, you know, I have been concerned that all of the focus has been on continuous, and there's been no focus on general sign-up, which I think is a big mistake. Sure. And especially for wildlife, big field CRP is what made wildlife come back. Right. And the reason we're losing it is because we're losing those big track CRP, in my opinion, and not my part of the world. But anyway, and the last thing, I'm over my time, but just your implementation of dairy, you, as I understand it, you're hoping to get that done by June. Is that correct? We are. Uh, I just had that in front of me here, and I think I've covered it up. Let me give you the dates on uh, our dairy margin. We think uh, uh, that we will... Uh, have sign up beginning June 17th, if that's specific enough. Now, we, uh, we make these predictions. We're not totally in control, as you know. It goes through an OMB process, whether it's significant or not significant, but these are what we think we can achieve. The interesting thing on the net refund provision that you all had on prior, uh, uh, prior premiums, uh, we think we can get that out in early April, uh, middle of April. Uh, and now we're at the end of April on the net refund uh, begins there. Uh, we think the calculator for farmers to calculate will be ready in the middle of April. And uh, we think on uh, July the 8th, and uh, we think that they can begin receiving the retroactive payments up to then. And uh, one of the, the challenges we've had on calculating it, in the effort, I think, in the last 14, in the 14 Farm Bill, in order to get people uh, serve quickly, they use paper recording there on many of the proponents. So it's not electronic. It's much more laborious to go back on the first two years and calculate who had, who got payments, who didn't, and whether the farms have been converted, they're still in business. There's a, really a lot of uh, uh, manual administrative work that has to be done on those two for, uh, on those two first two years. I think we could achieve even faster results if we didn't have that provision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I recognize the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, the, uh, <clears throat> many of your predecessors have shied away from uh, reorganizing the department. Uh, you seem to have taken this head on. Uh, I've taken a lot of heat on some of the decisions you've made, uh, but uh, most of them seem pretty rational to me. Uh, one of those was to create FPAC uh, and the FPAC Business Center. Will you please provide an update on the business center, plans to modernize the IT infrastructure, uh, about how far along are you with the process, and are those efforts improving program delivery and customer service at FSA, RMA, and NRCS? Would you visit with us about FPAC? Thank you, sir. I, I think, again, while many people maybe misunderstood our motives initially on that, uh, we began with the premise that if we're going to be customer-focused, we need to... Uh, not have customers going here and yon or reporting to different lines of, uh, uh, of reporting there. And having NRCS under the uh, In With The Forest Service, uh, we felt made more sense to have it aligned with our uh, FSA offices and created FPAC, the Farm Production and Conservation uh, Mission Area, uh, with a single secretary, Bill Northy of Iowa, who was the uh, Secretary of Agriculture in Iowa, an authentic farmer himself. And uh, we, I've been very pleased with the assimilation. After the early move your cheese kind of problems, uh, I've been very, very pleased with the anecdotal results that we hear from internal and external customers, both our NRCS uh, and uh, FSA, as well as our customers, I think, have given uh, good accolades to that. One specific example 
during the shutdown, as you recall, NRCS was funded uh, through mandatory programs, and they were uh, in the FSA offices co-located in many places and were helping answer farmer questions there. Even though they couldn't do the FSA work, they worked together and helped them catch up that way. So I think it's really a joint effort in serving the, the primary focus is serving that customer across the counter, whether it be from farm plans, conservation issues, or signing up for programs or loans for the FSA office. So I think by all accounts, uh, that, uh, that court, uh, combination has been a success. So the, uh, the backbone IT infrastructure, all the resources needed to be able to combine those to allow that one shop sign up, that that's, uh, you have the resources to make that happen? We're making progress. You know that IT doesn't move as fast as many of us would like, and, uh, but we are making progress on that. Our goal initially was to have uh, like one application. Uh, we've had different uh, between uh, RMA or the risk management or crop insurance. We have different criteria and different uh, blocks there. NRCS has different blocks in FSA. What we're trying to do from an IT perspective or uh, have some commonality there where people could look from a crop insurance to an NRCS to an FSA application and have some of the common uh, things filled out there where farmers would not be asked to go fill out all three. And uh, they're di they use different units. Sometimes uh, one uses acres, one uses bushels, and uh, it's a lot of things to work together, but I think we're... The business center and the IT is making progress on that, and hopefully we'll have that uh, uh, soon. I would say soon would probably be uh, early 2020. Thank you, Dad. Let the time remaining, would you give us your thoughts on uh, the USMCA, what, uh, where it's at, uh, where the winds are for production agriculture, and, uh, and just your perspective on, on, that, uh, on the trade deal? Well, certainly. Uh, it's a very, very important trade agreement, and... Uh, like any negotiated agreement, you don't get everything any side wants, all they want in that regard. Uh, I think if you remember when we began this process, there was sort of a, a, a big sucking sound from all of agriculture in the U.S. that said, oh, no, don't withdraw. NAFTA has been relatively good for agriculture, and I think we would agree with that. Uh, the fact is there were some things that uh, had been left out of the original NAFTA. President Trump had committed to a better deal, and I think if one is honest and objective in looking at the USMCA agreement, basically in every sector, in every sector, in every section, in every chapter, uh, you will find an improved agreement from labor uh, to ag to phytosanitary uh, provisions to uh, intellectual property to, uh, uh, to electronic trading, uh, certainly to rules of origin that will prevent, bring more jobs back to the U.S., but for agriculture, it's, uh, it's improved. Uh, I think uh, certainly there are people in some parts of the country, both in the southernmost uh, part and Florida and Georgia and vegetable producers, were not able to get the seasonal and, and perishable vegetable provisions they wanted. I can tell you that Ambassador Lighthizer uh, hung tough and promulgated those until the very end, and uh, at trading day, that, uh, that fell off. And, but. Uh, by and large, they're continuing to work on uh, side agreements whereby they can still have their day in court regarding a, a dumping, countervailing duty uh, type of situation on those products. But I think all in all, M M MC M C the uh, USMCA agreement is, uh, is improved, and I hope that we can all uh, look at the objectivity of it and understand this is in the best interest of the United States America economy and uh, vote for its ratification. One area, and I'll, if you'd like me to continue on the 232 tariffs, I can do that or I can answer that later. I want you to, I, there'll be other members that want to talk about USMCA, but uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your uh, solid service to uh, rural America and uh, you're making a great uh, secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're back. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, gentleman from Georgia, Scott. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, first I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the great work and partnership that you provided in helping us get the $80 million for the African American 1890s land grant colleges and universities. $80 million in the Farm Bill. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how appreciative we all are. And while I'm at it, please say hello to my good friend, your cousin, 
Senator David Perdue, who provided the sterling leadership in the Senate. What an extraordinary bipartisan program we have started together. Thank you for that. Deeply appreciate it. Uh, now, Mr. Secretary, I am very disturbed. I'm very frustrated with the treatment or lack of treatment of our farmers with these natural disasters. According to the University of Georgia, Georgia has suffered $2.8 billion in losses. On top of that, uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, we have got to do something. This is terrible. Agriculture is the single most important industry we have. It is the very foundation of this country, still is. You recognize that. You've traveled to all 50 states, and you know as I do, that in 44 of those states, it is agriculture and agriculture businesses that is the largest share of these states' economies. It's the food we eat, the water we drink clothes we wear, our shelter, who can be any more important to us than that? But right now, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Um, Secretary, we have got to sound the alarm bigger. If we don't get some pavements down to our Georgia farmers by April, we lose the planting season. That means two years that we're losing the planting season just coming from one natural disaster, Hurricane Michael. And in the last three years, we've had three different back-to-back. -back. In 2016, we had Hurricane Matthew. 2017, we had Hurricane Irma. 2018, we had Hurricane uh, Michael. And some of our Georgia farmers haven't had a crop since 2015. If that ain't enough to get us moving here. And so, uh, Mr. Secretary, I know you share the angst, the frustration that many of us do. Austin Scott and myself and Rick Allen, we've been up here beating the drum left and right. But this stuff has to stop. We got farmers hanging on by their fingernails. The suicide rate among farmers is alarming. Up in our dairy farmers particularly, but all over. So please tell us, what is it we've got to do from your standpoint to get the respect and the dignity that our farmers deserve? and help them. To my friend, Congressman Scott, I'd probably be better off just say amen and stop, but it's, uh, it's heartwarming to see you and uh, 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 your colleague, Mr. Uh, Scott, and uh, Mr. Allen on the same team there advocating for those disasters. And uh, you all live it. You know it. You've got constituents there. Uh, I thought uh, Congress did a wonderful job in the 2017 bill. We did... Uh, I thought an extraordinary job in administering the WHIP program there. Uh, you have no difference, and uh, I think it's uh, really a sad state of affairs that we've not cared for. Uh, the 2018 uh, uh, victims, as, as we did earlier, I believe there's still time to do that. You said April. Uh, we need it sooner rather than later. Hope we can do it even before April. I know that uh, the Senate has dropped a bill uh, that does take care of that. We were... Uh, frankly disappointed because it had been in most versions of the appropriations bill prior to the last times. And uh, hopefully we can see that restored. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, frankly, it's the necessary thing to do, as you said, and in, in your part uh, and uh, from, from your observation. And I appreciate your passion about that. I, uh, I certainly appreciate your passion about the, uh, the scholarship money that was done. That's uh, 
I feel a little bit like Derek, Davy Crockett's son. You, me, and Daddy killed the bear. You killed the bear, and I was there and watched. But uh, we, uh, Thank you. Uh, we appreciate your passion in that. I'm happy that we uh, agreed very early on that uh, these are students that we want to inculcate and incorporate into the future of agriculture and USDA. And I think we're making good progress there. I've been to many of the 1890 schools, and uh, they've got some great programs. Been down with your colleague, Mr. Lawson, at his alma mater, and I think your alma mater, I believe. Yes, sir. And, uh, uh, and they're doing good work. So we look forward to utilizing the extra money. I'm glad to see you're presuming about that other $40 million from the appropriators, our $40 million. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that works out. But nonetheless, we're going to do a good job of that. But I, I, I want to echo your comments to your colleagues primarily, and I know the message is to all of us. This disaster must be done. It must be done soon, or there will be some real harm uh, going on. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. <laughs> well, guess what I want to talk about. <laughs> Secret Secretary Purdue, always, always good to see you. Um, you mentioned uh, the USMCA, uh, the seasonal issues with the dumping. Uh, obviously, uh, for the, the farmers that I represent, that is the number one concern is, is, that, uh, is that there are no um, provisions in the, in the current draft that would keep Mexico from dumping at a subsidized price in our markets at, at harvest time. And so that's something I look um, forward to having further discussions about. I have talked with Secretary Lighthouser about it as well, and uh, I appreciate the fact that you brought that up without, uh, without being, e even having to be asked about it, that you recognize that that's a concern for our growers. I want to, um, but the number one issue right now, and quite honestly, I get more phone calls from bankers than I'm getting from farmers sure. uh, these days um, about disaster relief. And I know that you... Uh, we're there with the president. I think it was October the 15th and the vice president on October 16th uh, when, when Vice President Pence, who I very much uh, like and respect, made the statement, uh, we will, um, we will be, be with you until we succeed, I believe, was um, um, what he said. Certainly there was a sense of relief that came across uh, at the Sunbelt Ag Expo in Colquitt County when those statements came from uh, Vice President Pence, I, um, I know a Senate bill has been introduced. I know uh, Senator Perdue, I spoke, saw him on Monday, uh, and, and Senator Isaacson have both indicated they're doing everything they can to push that bill as soon as possible. Uh, before I go any further, I want to thank Jim McGovern, the Chairman of the Rules Committee and Sanford Bishop for their work in helping us plus up the amount available to agriculture, available but uh, to agriculture uh, for the bill to a number that is much more reasonable with, with regard to the total losses are. But I, I'm at a loss for what to tell my people. When I get off of I-75 and I go home, I drive past the, these fields. I drive past these farmers' homes. I drive, I, I know these people. We go to church with them. We're, uh, I've been telling them since October, help is coming. And and I honestly don't know what to tell them anymore. It, it feels like a broken promise back home to the people when we, when we just keep saying, help is coming. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, certainly uh, understandable. I believe, uh, based on what we were all led to believe, that this uh, money was in that appropriation bill and uh, was removed in the crisis of whatever. I don't know that it does any good to play, even try to do the forensics on a blame game from a diagnosis. I think we've got to go forward and I think use the, the, uh, uh, the structure that's before us right now to cure this as quickly as possible so we don't have to answer those questions very long. Uh, we've both gotten them and they're reasonable. Not only, as you said, we're producers, it was as much uh, their financiers asking that of uh, whether they're going to be able to pay out loans for people that had great crops. We know that we have a good safety net in the farm bill, but uh, uh, things like pecan trees and timber right. and those kind of things, even losing the bumper crop in cotton uh, 
that was blown away. That's right. And and the uh, the safety net there doesn't replace uh, the profit was needed to repay loans and go forward again in the next year. So I think we just need to go forward expeditiously, as quickly as this Congress can move to rectify what was I think a significant. Uh, leave out of the previous appropriation there. I do believe that uh, your colleague in the state and the uh, appropriator, or the chairman of the Appropriations on Ag, Mr. Bishop, is uh, very interested in that. You know that he has many of these uh, producers in his district that got hardest hit, and we do appreciate Mr. McGovern and others uh, <coughs> doing, plussing that up. If you look back at how we uh, expended the uh, WIP program for 2017, I think you'll find that we did it very judiciously. And frankly, there have been very little complaints that I'm aware of uh, uh, since that time as well. And we expedited that and I think made you all proud of uh, putting the money out there and we got it in the hands of the people that needed it most. And, and I think that the previous WIP is, is proof that the checks and balances were there with that system so that, uh, that we provide the relief that is, that is necessary, but that we're not. Uh, making somebody more than whole uh, prior to the storm. And so I, I appreciate your, your support of the farmers. I know, uh, I know you feel the pain as I do when you go, when you go home, you live in, in the 8th District. And uh, just any, any help with uh, helping with, with getting this thing expedited would be appreciated. The good Thank news, you. I think, uh, uh, Chairman, or Mr. Scott, is that uh, Having had the experience last year of designing that program, I think we're way ahead of the curve. It won't take us nearly as long to implement and get money into these hands as it did uh, last year. Even though that was quick, I think we're, uh, it'll be a very similar type of program. Uh, trees and those kind of things have not been a typical uh, uh, issue of the Farm Bill before or part of USDA. But uh, we, we think we have a better, after the citrus experience list last year, We've got a better idea of how to do that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, gentlemen. And I want, uh, as I said in my opening statement, um, I'll do anything I can do to I know how much uh, anybody will pay attention to me. But whatever good it'll do, uh, we're there to help you. Um, gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. Mr. Chairman, I always pay attention to you. And uh, for the ranking member, uh, this is an important hearing for our House Agriculture Committee to get a report early in the year by our Secretary of Agriculture to uh, discuss the status of the challenges American agriculture is facing, and they are many. And we know the farm economy is suffering, uh, not only across the country, but in California as well. Um, as the uh, new subcommittee chair of livestock and foreign trade, in speaking with the uh, chair of our committee and members of the subcommittee, we intend to early on hold a uh, hearing as it relates to the challenges facing uh, U.S. dairy industry and the changes in the program that you uh, cited earlier in your comments. And the timeline that you laid out to us, Mr. Secretary, I think will be probably uh, uh, good as it relates to better understanding how we attempt to address the economic uh, challenges, the loss of liquidity that is affecting dairy, uh, not only in California, but around the country. Uh, so we look forward to coordinating with you on that timeline and on that very important subcommittee hearing, uh, probably in April, I would guess. Um, let me also cite to you, before I get to my question, Mr. Secretary, that on February 1st, uh, uh, a significant portion of the California congressional delegation sent you a letter about the impacts of the f devastating forest fires that have impacted not only California, but the entire West. The United States Department of Forestry obviously has the responsibility for the jurisdiction of coordinating with individual states. And uh, the question that we cited in the letter that we sent to you uh, about a month ago was trying to determine uh, the impacts of the 35 days of the government shutdown, the closure, uh, as it relates to uh, uh, contracts that had been uh, um, uh, noted for hiring, training, for new firefighting personnel and other mitigation efforts that were put on hold for 35 days. Uh, we have not yet received a response, Mr. Secretary, and certainly would like, I, I, I think I can speak for the California delegation, we'd like to find out where we are on that because obviously after the winter we'll have another fire season that we'll have to contend with and we hope for the best. 
Um, let me, uh, so if you can get back to us, give us an idea when you, you can get some answers to us on the, on the questions that we asked. Uh, absolutely, and uh, I'm uh, embarrassed that we've not responded already. We've uh, set new accountability terms in, in our office over a timely, um, timeliness of responses. I'll, uh, as you finish, I'll do my best to give you All right. a, a verbal answer. Very good. Let me ask you my question. It's on trade, part of the jurisdiction of the subcommittee. Uh, last week, Canadian Ambassador uh, David uh, McNaughton to the uh, United States and White House Economic Advisor Larry Kudlow predicted that the administration could remove Section 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum in a matter of weeks. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I don't need to tell you that the retaliation of U.S. agriculture as a result of these tariffs have been incredibly difficult to our producers. Dairy producers, processors, depend on exporting their cheese to Mexico. I have a significant uh, processor that you met uh, when you came to California last year. 20% uh, of his product goes to Mexico. Uh, we have products that uh, are in decline in China and India, exports to Canada, the list goes on. 44% of California agriculture depends upon foreign trade. The President admitted last week that his strategy to get the USMCA approved was to threaten the use or increase of 232 tariffs on Canada and Mexico. That's also impacted our European allies. He also threatened to withdraw from NAFTA before USMCA is brought to a vote. I think that strategy is a mistake. I was in Mexico in December for the inauguration. They simply said, look it, we're willing to reduce our, our tariffs, but we want you to pass USMC, and that's our only leverage. So my question to you is, uh, whether than uh, pursuing new markets and trade deals, which we need to do with Japan, and we need to resolve with China, where are we with regards to USMCA and these 232 tariffs? Uh, can you confirm that Ambassador McNaughton and Larry Kudlow have hinted on that the administration will finally remove these, I think, misguided uh, 232 tariffs in the next few weeks? Uh, I can confirm that we've had discussions at my level with my contemporaries, both uh, uh, Minister McCauley in Canada and uh, Secretary Villalobos in uh, Mexico regarding the interest of all three countries to ratify USMCA, which we all believe would uh, uh, need to have the 232 tariffs resolved as well. I, think I mean, that's their only leverage, obviously. They want it to pass. We want it to pass. But we need to get going. Uh, certainly. Uh, I think, uh, again, the, uh, the removal of the tariffs, I think, is in the interest of all, and we're advocating to the administration to do that. Certainly, the president has responsibility for the whole economy. He uh, began the, uh, the 232 investigation, demonstrated a weakness in our steel and uh, aluminum sector, and uh, the potential for losing— But the 80 percent target date on aluminum said that's been met. Yes, sir. Uh, and I think what we're moving toward is a resolution over the tariffs, possibly to be replaced by reasonable quotas with which uh, Canada and Mexico uh, can live and uh, uh, have the retaliatory tariffs removed. We look forward to continuing to work with you. My time's expired, but this is a critical issue and obviously for uh, American agriculture, sure. as you know. I may respond on the Forest Service uh, regarding your letter and your question. I think overall, uh, uh, the hiring program, while we were concerned about that, preparing, preparing for the 2019 far, fire service, our undersecretary and chief tell me that they have uh, regained the momentum that way. We don't think there will be any permanent harm. I do want to mention, uh, however, uh, I failed to mention earlier regarding the disaster provision. In the appropriation bill that was passed, the backfill of the money that we used in, uh, to fight suppressed forest fires this past year was not refilled. That's been typically done. Over $720 million that we took from operations to help prevent forest fires and suppressing forest fires, that's money that we need to fill that back so we can continue to do the things you've authorized us to do. Duly noted. We'll work with our friends with the uh, Appropriations Committee. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, I appreciate you being here today. I think my colleagues have been drinking muddy water because I can't see through them. But uh, anyway. Uh, it's the Red River Valley up there. Exactly. It took them a sec to figure out what I was talking about there. Um, I want to commend you on the regulatory reform that you're undertaking. 
Um, we worked on a deal in the Farm Bill last time around that uh, removed the Sam's and Dunn, uh, Sam and Dunn's requirements, and I know that you're working on that. Thank you for that. That's going to go a long way. I wanted to ask if there was specifically any um, uh, other regulatory initiatives that you are undertaking right now that might also provide some relief to farmers. Well, I think uh, working on, I believe we have that Sam's Dunn issue that was very uh, troubling. I think we have it done. And uh, the good news is farmers uh, don't have to uh, do that any longer. That was an unnecessary provision. Again, I think in the overall management of being the most effective and efficient, whether regulations or policy or just management tactics, we're ongoing working in, uh, in things that will make uh, us better customer servants there of the people that depend on us to implement the farm bill in that way. Obviously, many of the things that you talk about from a regulatory standpoint uh, have to do with implementation of the farm bill. We're trying to make it as user friendly as possible. Uh, again, on labor is a great issue there over the H-2A program. Uh, we're working with the Department of Labor uh, to eliminate the very onerous provisions of having to advertise in several counties and regions in order to qualify to get H-2A provisions. We are uh, creating at USDA sort of a turbo tax type model portal where the farmer can come there, fill out all the information. We send that then to, uh, uh, to labor, uh, HHS, or not DHS and uh, Secretary of State, State Department in order to, as the primary statutory provisions on H-2A to help do that. We think that will be a big help it's, there still need to be statutory changes made in the uh, labor uh, force, but that's one area that we're trying to work on as well that will enable people to get uh, the labor they need on their high-touch crops. Um, some of my colleagues have mentioned USMCA, and you've addressed that as well, but just give me your gut assessment of what happens if we don't uh, close the deal on USMCA. Uh, I don't like to think about that. Uh, I, I don't either. I think it would be devastating, and I hope everyone uh, and all 434 of your colleagues understand uh, the threat that would be to the U.S. economy, especially the ag economy, uh, if we don't ratify that. I hope that, frankly, uh, everyone here, who I believe is well intended, will put uh, partisan politics aside to vote for the uh, benefit of the country in, the US, in ratifying the USMCA. Uh, let me just ask you, uh, finally, in, the, in this, this, you don't have enough time to answer this uh, completely, but just give me your assessment of a Green New Deal. Uh, there's uh, some estimates out there that it's going to cost a ton of money, uh, money that we don't have. Uh, certainly, what we know is that farmers are uh, active environmentalists as opposed to environmental activists, and so I think we can count on farmers to do the right thing with regard to protecting the environment. But give me your assessment on, on the Green New Deal as it's proposed and what the impact might be on agriculture in general. You're right, I don't have time to answer that. But uh, aside from giving our cattle Pepto-Bismol, I'm not sure what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't ask anything further, Mr. Secretary, but I do want to commend you again for doing a fantastic job. It's, uh, it's very um, uh, Satisfying to see the right person in the right job at the right time, and you are certainly that person. So thanks so much for all you do. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, gentlelady from uh, Ohio, Ms. Fudge. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much, Mr. Secretary, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, under your leadership, USDA has implemented a series of what I really believe are kind of half-baked proposals to reorganize the department and introduce harmful regulations that we have had to come behind you and correct. In, 27, in May of 2017, you eliminated the position of Undersecretary for Rural Development. Congress restored it permanently in the Farm Bill. In August of 2018, you proposed the relocation of ERS and NIFA, as well as decided to put ERS under the direction of the Chief Economist. Uh, just in our most recent appropriations bill, the language delays this because we want to be sure that you are doing this in a way that makes some sense. So we have requested that you provide cost estimates and a detailed analysis to show us this plan before it can proceed. Uh, this past December, you issued a proposed rule on ABODs, and it's my understanding that you are getting ready to develop another rule to limit categorical eligibility. Congress debated these proposals just last year during the Farm Bill. They were rejected. You call it a missed opportunity. We call it an intentional 
rejection. Um, it is important to me to try to understand what your disdain is for poor people or people who have had fallen on hard times or people who are just living on the edge because what you're doing in these proposals is hurting those very people. Um, further, uh, you have tried to circumvent other rules and this one in particular really, really bothers me. Uh, there was a woman, there is a woman, her name is Naomi Earp, Churchill Earp, who has been nominated for the position of Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. Mm -hmm. This is a person who couldn't even get confirmed to be an EEOC commissioner. This is a person that the entire civil rights uh, community has said is not good for civil rights. And so I'm not sure if you really are interested in civil rights or if you just want the person because you want them for some other reason. But I am concerned that now you have made her a deputy to go around the process of confirmation. It is just difficult for me to, to figure out where you're going. And if, in fact, you really do care about underserved communities, about people who have had problems with the department, uh, or those who have difficulty finding a job. So my first question to you, Mr. Secretary, is with your new ABODS rule, can you please tell me what percentage of ABODS are veterans, are homeless, have mental or physical limitations, lack access to public transportation, or need language interpretation? That would help me determine how many people you're really talking about. Um, Ms. Fudge, I don't have those statistics in front of me today. I can get them for you, but I would uh, respectfully disagree with many of your conclusions. Uh, if you can begin with the Secretary of Rural Development, as you mentioned, uh, we still don't have a confirmed uh, secretary in uh, two other important issues, along with Ms. Naomi Earp in civil rights. There are three of those uh, out there that we don't, both all three very qualified people. Uh, we wanted to get started very quickly on rural development. The farm bill before had uh, created an undersecretary for trade uh, that had not been filled because there was not money appropriated for that. We moved that to an undersecretary for trade because we thought trade was one of the most important ones and moved to uh, ask Ann Hazlett to come from the Senate committee. Re reclaiming my time, you thought that, but the Congress who makes these decisions didn't think that. Well, I, I think that was totally under the purview of the USDA to do that, ma'am. Well, we put it back in the farm bill, so it couldn't have been certainly. And we're delighted to have that. And I look forward to having a confirmed undersecretary for uh, rural development. I welcome that. That was not, uh, uh, it was no provision to do that prior to that. You had seven, and we needed eight. That, that, that sounds like a problem with your, in your department, sir. I mean, the Congress determined what we wanted to see, and that is what we expect to see. And I'm, I'm happy to have the eighth, and I appreciate that, and we'll, uh, we'll certainly comply with that. Uh, we've, we've already well, have a no you nominee to be presented. Reclaiming my time, reclaiming my time. You say you comply with it, but you turn around and try to promulgate a rule that is in direct conflict so, to something we just put in the bill last year. I think it, uh, I do classify as a missed opportunity, and I want to just, uh, since you brought that up, I'd like to give you a couple of quotes from former Democratic presidents. When this bill was signed, for instance, President Clinton said, I've made my principles for real welfare reform very clear from the beginning. First and foremost, it should be about moving people from welfare to work. It should impose time limits on welfare. It should give people all that they need in order to go to work. This legislation meets these principles to give us a chance we haven't had before to break the cycle of dependency that has existed for millions and millions of our fellow citizens, exiling them from the world of work. It gives structure, meaning, and dignity. But my to time most is of up, Mr. Mr. Secretary, but let me just suggest to you, President Clinton was in, he was in office 20 plus years ago. Secondly, the economy has changed. And thirdly, and more importantly, you can't even tell me who this affects. I yield back my time, Mr. I'll Chief. be happy to. I'd like to quote from another president who was in office long before that, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who said, the lessons of history show conclusively that continued dependency upon relief induces a spiritual and moral disintegration that is fundamentally destructive to the national fiber. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, the gentleman from, uh, let's see here. Kind of see, Mr. Deasley. I thank the chairman. Uh, Secretary Purdue, we're very grateful to have you here today. 
Uh, so many of my friends back in Tennessee at the Tennessee Farm Bureau, Tennessee Cattlemen, Poultry Industries, Cotton Council, et cetera, have been so pleased with the attentiveness, attentiveness you've shown to Tennessee, making many trips there, and uh, they're very, very grateful for your service, so we thank you for that. Um, one concern we have uh, in our district, and I'm sure many others here, is the uh, rural areas have continued to struggle with insufficient internet connectivity and broadband service. Could you talk about the changes made in the new farm bill uh, to improve rural broadband and as well as the USDA's plan to implement those changes and help bridge the digital divide? I appreciate this question very much. I think it has the potential to be one of the most transformative things we can do for rural America to bridge the urban-rural divide with connectivity and data access certainly in telemedicine, uh, distance learning, uh, rural economics of entrepreneurship, as well as precision agriculture. I think we need a moonshot of broadband connectivity all over this country, not just in Tennessee, but in every rural hamlet field around, the wor around this nation. And I think the sooner we get there, the better off the economy of the country will be. We've taken the $600 million that you all appropriated last year and developed a very good program based on those unserved areas, not duplication uh, for applications. People are busy doing their uh, applications. We give them information and we hope to receive those applications very soon to deploy these and demonstrate to you all that USDA can get the job done regarding rural broadband connectivity. Uh, what, what does uh, really soon mean? Can you give us a time frame? Yes, the application should be uh, accepted around May 1. Excellent. Um, as you're aware, uh, I want to turn to rural lending for a minute. You're aware uh, credit availability is crucial to farmers, ranchers, and forest owners. Uh, there's been some concern in my district regarding USDA's lending branch of the Farm Service Agency. Uh, what is the USDA doing to ensure FSA offices are staffed and ready to meet the needs of the vulnerable producers? Well, obviously, labor and workforce is, continues to be at the forefront. You can't get things done without appropriate uh, 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 people to do that. We continue to work. We've authorized a hiring plan, and uh, you probably are aware that it's not the most easy, uh, easy place to onboard workers into the federal government, but we are aggressively pursuing uh, on a needs-based uh, every area. We've tried to uh, put uh, not cookie-cutter approach, but look at the workload in every F FSA office to make sure they have the people to, uh, to meet the needs, but that's a continuing challenge. Well, speaking of labor and workforce, that's one comment I hear from constituents and employers in my district time and time again. They're very thankful for this booming and robust economy, but very frustrated about the insufficiencies in the workforce. Uh, can you discuss USDA's, USDA's proposed rule that would adjust requirements for able-bodied adults without dependence on SNAP and how this would foster self-sufficiency and bolster our workforce? Well, as part of our previous conversation, we think, again, uh, the uh, helping people. We believe the purpose of our welfare sh system should help people to, to become independent rather than uh, a permanent dependency. We believe it does this uh, with uh, six and a half million people unemployed and seven, over seven million uh, jobs out there. Uh, we think again from the 20 hour a week of training or volunteer even or working, uh, if people have a job that's uh, uh, they still qualify for SNAP. They'll still be eligible to get food assistance in that way. So we think we are helping people to, uh, uh, to again, move into the dignity of work and the respect of providing for their families. Uh, it amazed me that that was taken out of the Farm Bill when across the country over 80 percent of people agree with this concept, whether you're a Democrat, Independent, Republican. Uh, you can go ask your constituents. People believe that able-bodied people who can work should work. Do you have any idea why there might be so many so much pushback and concerns on this measure, and can you clarify to help alleviate that issue? I have no clue. Well, me either. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Thank McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and welcome, Mr. Secretary. Um, I was here, I think, with the first time you testified uh, before this committee was, I think, back in May of 2017. And as you know, I care very much about the issue of food insecurity and sure. hunger. Uh, and um, I asked you a question uh, back then. I said, I'm, I'm, looking, I, I'm looking for some assurances that you're a strong defender of the program, meaning SNAP, that you're not advocating structural changes or trying to put more hurdles in place to make it more difficult for people to get food, because it's a concern a lot of people in this country uh, have. 
And so I'd be interested in hearing your views on what you plan for SNAP. And I thought your answer was brilliant. Uh, you began with, Mr. McGovern, I agree with you. Um, and, and I still then, do. And then, it, and then you went on to support, talk about how you support the program, and it, you ended with, but as far as I'm concerned, we have no proposed changes. You don't have to, you don't try to fix things that aren't broken. And when the motto is do right and feed everyone, I view that uh, as very inclusive. And I, I, was, I was comforted by that. And, um, but like uh, my colleague, Ms. Fudge, I, I'm concerned about some of the actions um, by the department, especially in the aftermath of a farm bill which rejected uh, the, some of the uh, uh, issues that have been raised here by my colleague from Tennessee. Uh, and, um, and that's with regard to able-bodied adults uh, um, without uh, dependents. Um, just by the way, the reason, uh, if the gentleman was still here, I would tell him that the concern that many of us have is that this is a very comp complex population. Uh, this is just not a bunch of people hanging around uh, doing nothing, uh, trying to take advantage of, of, of government programs. This population includes returning veterans who are having a difficult time reintegrating into our society. It includes um, uh, uh, young people who have recently aged out of foster care. It includes people recovering from opi opiates and individuals who were subjected to mass incarceration. Uh, and, um, and I also want to say to the gentleman who, who left, um, and, and, uh, and Mr. Secretary, to you, I think you, you mentioned uh, that you, we, we don't want to encourage a life of dependency on these programs. Um, that's not the reality. I mean, the average person on SNAP is on the benefit for less than a year. Um, and that's according to your own statistics in your, in your, in your department. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the proposals that you're putting forward. And your language in the proposed rule, I think, continues to stigmatize people on SNAP. Um, and it blocks states from using their own discretion and waiving work requirements. You know, different states have different needs. As, and as we all know, this would especially create a crisis in rural areas. Able-bodied adults without dependents, as I said, are a complex, already vulnerable demographic that will be further immobilized if you take their food away. So I guess my question to you is, was there any specific research FNS used to justify this rule change? Governor, let me say initially that I appreciate your passion for yeah. this, uh, this constituency, and I think uh, I stand by my answer when you referred to my question last year, and uh, I still think that we agree on many of those things. I do believe that uh, uh, what I said earlier regarding dependency, as uh, I agree with uh, President Roosevelt, I think it leads to a, uh, a decline in, in personal dignity. We are talking about able-bodied adults without dependents. Some Correct. of them have issues. Right. I think what you all have done masterfully in criminal justice reform desigmatizes right. that part of the population. We're talking about not just getting a job, but getting prepared to go to work, which I think enables them. I was a former governor. My job as a governor was to draw down as much federal dollars as I could because I didn't have any skin in the game. Right. And that's what we see across the country with these waivers, which we believe, I believe, I know that they were abused in Georgia. I believe they're being abused in many places. Well, I mean, I've talked to a lot of governors who would take issue with you on that. But let, let, let me, as I said, I mean, this is, uh, there are a lot of people who will be affected by this change are veterans, children who have recently aged out of foster care, people recovering from opiates, and individuals who were subjected to mass incar incarceration. I'm just trying to understand the basis for you know the the the, uh, the change. Does USDA have data on the demographics within the ABOD classification? We will ha be happy to provide you. And what so I, we have. I would request uh, on the record that you share this data with the, with the sure. committee because I think it would be it would be helpful. I mean, and again, I mean, is are, are, there, are there specific is there specific research in FNS to justify the rule change, or can you point uh, me to specific research that proves that taking someone's SNAP benefits away will help them get a job? Mr. Governor, we are simply trying to preserve the integrity of the law as it was passed by Republicans and Democrats in 1996, which indicated there is a time period when a loss of a job or a health right. issue uh, would give right. people an opportunity right. to have these benefits for a 120 days. You know, and I, and I understand that, and because the population we're talking about um, is complicated, um, and there are hurdles for many of these people to be able to get into a 
work training program or to get a job. I mean, returning veterans who are having a difficult time reintegrating back into the community, for example. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to understand you know, the benefit of throwing these people off of a food benefit, how that helps them get a job. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand that. I mean, this is not a population, contrary to what some have suggested, who are just lazy, who don't want to work. This is a very complicated population, and I want to know what the research is and what the data is that the department is using to, to, to basically justify this rule change. And I would appreciate it if, if there is such data, if there is a study, if NS, F, FNS has done something, to be able to share that with this committee. Uh, because one of the problems when we, when we talk about uh, uh, this, when we talk about SNAP and we talk about ABODs is we tend to generalize. Uh, everything fits into a nice, neat category. Uh, it's a much more complicated population. It's a vulnerable population. And I'm worried that if we go forward with what you're proposing, a lot of people are going to be hurt. And by the way, um, I think it goes against what the Farm Bill, um, which was passed in a bipartisan way, um, advocated for. Um, and I think um, you know, we will do everything we can to protect this population. Um, and, and, and if that means going to court, we will go to court as well. I appreciate that. We are actively and aggressively addressing many of the uh, needs of the veterans and incorporating them into USDA as well as agricultural environment to help these people. We've got education and training programs specific for them as well as some of the other vulnerable populations that you mentioned. Well, I, again, I, we would appreciate any research that you have or any data that could justify what you are doing. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, gentlelady from Missouri, Hartler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for all that you are doing. And I know that you care about all Americans, uh, no matter their income level. And uh, specifically regarding the conversation we just had, I just wanted to clarify that the changes and the proposals that you are putting forth uh, don't kick people off. They give them an opportunity to get some training. And then if they participate in a training program to help them link to the 7.3 million open jobs available right now, that, that they can keep their benefits. Isn't that correct? Better said than I did. Okay, thank you. I would, wanted to move on to um, the program that was referenced earlier about uh, relocating the two USDA research agencies, the National Institute for Food and Agriculture and the Economic Research Service. And I just want to let you know that those of us in Missouri are excited about th that opportunity. I think you've gotten some letters from us uh, uh, commending you on that. Uh, we believe that we have the personnel and the, the individuals with the skills necessary Necessary, and we would love to have those located there. Uh, could you kind of give us an update on your rationale for why you wanted to, to move this agency out of D.C., out of the Beltway, and move it closer to the heartland, closer to where the farmers are? Sure, surely. Uh, you, along with 135 others, would be happy, <laughs> I think, with the expressions of interest that we got. And uh, we're certainly doing a, a uh, very thorough uh, objective process. In fact, we engaged an accounting firm, er Ernst & Young, that's used to doing these kind of relocations assessments in order to make sure that uh, we uh, did not involve any kind of political pressure or biases in that in any, any way, evaluating these. Uh, and there are some very interesting uh, offers out there. Certainly, uh, from a management perspective, having uh, been governor as well as a business person, I think uh, uh, you go where you can attract the best labor force. And uh, what we saw from testimony, I think a letter that Mr. Ramaswani, who was the former director of NIFA, talked about the difficulty of living in Washington, D.C. with its cost of living. Uh, we think also it's costly to the federal government here. NIFA had a, a uh, lease was up and had, a, uh, uh, had the need to move locations. And uh, that's what began me thinking about the possibility of both these agencies being more relocated closer to the heartland of where their customers, most of their customers are. We plan on leaving a contingent of leadership in both those agencies, ERS and NIFA here, to be responsive to Congress and any other agencies here, interagency type of relationships that we need to develop uh, from a professional perspective there. But frankly, most of the recruits that we have in a early PhD program it's very difficult to uproot young families and try to give them a, 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 a definite uh, quality of life here in the D.C. area uh, in many ways. So I understand it's a change and people don't like change. We think there are adequate reasons. We'd be happy to 
uh, outside this outside these hearings today that we don't have time, I'd be happy to discuss uh, anyone that has uh, major questions about that, our reasoning. Sounds good. Uh, your tweet on Friday about the commitment from the Chinese to purchase 10 uh, million mega, uh, tons of soybeans was great news. Uh, can we look forward to purchase commitments on other commodities like ethanol and DDGs uh, as part of the negotiations? I sure hope so. I'll give you a cute anecdote that happened in the meeting there uh, when the Vice Premier Hu uh, gave that commitment. Uh, the President said, Sonny, go out and tell your farmers that uh, we, we got 10 million more bushels. That's a big deal, right? I said, yes, Mr. President. He said, go and tell them. I, I kept sitting there. I did not leave. And he said, uh, aren't you going to go tell them? I said, no, I'm hoping there'll be more. And uh, <laughs> the Vice Premier looked at me and said, there'll be more. So, uh, but I'm, we're optimistic. We have to be cautiously optimistic. These negotiations are never over until they're over uh, with the Chinese, and we've got a lot of details, a lot of, frankly, hurdles in order to get there. There are some structural reforms and non-tariff measures that have to be agreed to in order to reach the kind of uh, uh, lofty uh, purchase require, uh, potential that's out there for the Chinese. So we're hopeful uh, that'll be determined uh, Later, I think we'll continue to make progress, but ultimately I think uh, President Xi and President Trump will have to decide that it's time to restore relationships in a meaningful and forcible way that uh, reforms the uh, intellectual property transfer issues that we felt were uh, uh, damaging our national economy uh, initially. Absolutely. We appreciate all your work and all your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thanks, gentlelady, and I'm pleased to recognize the gentlelady from North Carolina, who, by the way, is the vice chair of the uh, Agriculture Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you uh, to our ranking member as well uh, for hosting this session. And Secretary Perdue, thank you for your testimony and, and welcome back. Uh, I was uh, proud to work with a bipartisan group of my colleagues to authorize at least three centers of excellence at 1890 land-grant universities in last year's Farm Bill and $5 million have been appropriated for these centers in the 2019 Appropriations Bill. And many of us on the committee and in Congress want to ensure that the 1890s get the funding and the support that uh, needed from USDA to establish these centers of excellence and um, to do the kind of research that, um, that is necessary for them to do. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, curious about uh, your commitment to work with us to ensure that the Farm Bill authorized level of funding of $10 million will be inc is included uh, in the President's uh, 2020 budget. Uh, I don't know that I can commit what will or will not be in the President's budget, but I can commit if it's there uh, as, as you all appropriate it. Uh, we're going to obviously fulfill your vision for what we do with that uh, in, in, in fine fashion. I think I want to mention one other thing about that. I think one of the better things you all did uh, regarding the 1890s and the Farm Bill was to stop the rescission of the money that you're giving out there, uh, them being treated differently than others. That will go a long way. Well, I want to thank you for that. That was an amendment that I had, and, and you supported that. Uh, you saw the, um, the, um, uh, the inequity there. Uh, certainly, that's what it was, and uh, I appreciate your support there. And would, uh, again, just like to have your support uh, going forward. I know you can't tell the president what to do, right. uh, but I certainly um, hope that you will uh, certainly emphasize that. Um, I also want to um, ask about your decision to appoint Naomi uh, uh, Earp as the Deputy Assistant Secretary. I understand that some issues uh, around her views on civil rights and so forth uh, have um, raised some concerns um, it, by the NAACP and other communities, and uh, I think you may have responded to that, but if you could just tell me a little bit more, I'd appreciate it. I was uh, extremely impressed in looking at uh, her resume, but more impressed when I met her personally, quizzed her on her passion and commitment to uh, fulfilling the laws of the land regarding our responsibility at USDA to fulfill the uh, civil rights components in all aspects there. I was assured that uh, she was prepared to do that, and certainly uh, looking at her, she is professionally qualified, having uh, led efforts at EEOC and others in that realm. Uh, I found her to be eminently qualified, and I look forward to her confirmation. Well, okay, I won't, I won't go any further with that, but just to say that there are lots of concerns in the, in the community about not only things that she said 
uh, but uh, the way she has conducted herself as it relates to civil rights. Um, you know, um, our committee appreciates the work of the Food and Nutrition Services. Uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, to uh, add my support for SNAP and my colleagues who have raised that issue. Um, you know, I think when we talk about able-bodied folk and people needing to work, that there are many circumstances that create uh, problems for them. Uh, we have a skills gap. Yes, there are lots of jobs, but in terms of whether or not people have those skills to do those jobs, I think that has to be considered as well. Uh, and also, um, in terms of the children who will be, uh, who will be impacted, if you take uh, from the parents and those who are responsible for those children, the children suffer at home and at school. So I wanted to, to just raise that and say that child care and many other things come into, into play and sometimes, uh, you know, if our bellies are not hungry, uh, have not uh, suffered that pain, we don't understand the pain of other folk. But anyway, uh, I think I'm about uh, running out of time, but I'll submit any other questions I may have to you in writing. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield back. Thank you, General Eddy. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. LaMoffa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Secretary, uh, we appreciate your appearance here today. Thank you for uh, your time with, with us here. And uh, also for your diligence in... Uh, what we've dealt with in Northern California with uh, the fire season, with the car fire in Redding, California, which we thought was devastating, and then add to that uh, the camp fire in Paradise, California, on top of that. And your, your diligence of your office and our other partners in Interior and Homeland Security has been pretty am amazing and appreciated. So um, as we know, 650,000 acres burned just in my first district of California this year. 93 lives have been lost in the two fires combined. That points out we need to dramatically change how we manage forests in uh, California and the western states and across the country. Just in California, we have 130 million dead trees and counting um, across our 9 million acres in the state of forested lands. Um, and we need to do treatment on it. We've got to do the kind of treatment that will help us to uh, mitigate wildfire risk. You know, you don't eliminate wildfire risk because lightning happens and people happen too. But you can certainly make a forested situation much more manageable when a fire does occur, as we had many years ago when the inventory of trees per acre and, and brush, et cetera, was uh, much lower and much different in a natural setting. We've been putting fires out for 100 years, and now, you know, we've got an overload of inventory of, uh, of that material. So, <clears throat> needless to say, we had some really good provisions in the Farm Bill that uh, passed the House on the forestry title. A lot of that was eliminated over in the, on the Senate side. When we were, well, I'm glad we got the Farm Bill done. We did get some good pieces in there, but uh, some really uh, important uh, uh, leaps for all of us would, would have been there with that other, the other parts in that title. So... Um, we did a lot of work on that, and then the, the work that was done in the omnibus previously that had uh, forestry efforts in it really falls short of what we need to do. And it, it's very important to the, the assets that we're supposed to be stewards of in the USDA through the U.S. Forest Service, that the forest asset, the habitat that it means, and the human lives that are affected. So we got to have strong management here. And at the rate we're going under previous regimes with uh, basically 1% of our U.S. Forest Service land being touched per year, it'll take 100 years to get across and treat them. And we don't have 100 years for the hundreds of thousands of acres that burn in the West every year especially. So we've, we've tried to ensure the Forest Service has every tool available uh, on funding, on uh, separating uh, disaster funding from your, your main course of funding. Um, but we need, we need to be much more aggressive at this. So can, can you, Mr. Secretary, update me on how we're, how we're putting in place something that will move at a greater, greater speed than 1% a year nationally or even maybe up to a 30-year period to, to cover California on, uh, on, the, on the treatment we need on all of our acres to be better habitat, more fire safe, more healthy, and to boot an economy. Thank you. I'll do my best. I think we are making progress in both policy, uh, in authorities, and uh, in funding. 
As you know, the fire funding fix doesn't begin until this next fiscal year. That's why I felt compelled to mention the $720 million that uh, we had taken out of the kitty of operations to do exactly what you're asking to do in order to suppress fires uh, coming up. We need that to refill so we can begin to do that. We have to prioritize. As you said, there's so much. What we're trying to do, what I've challenged the fire service to do, is to prioritize on those wildland urban uh, interfaces that are the most threatening. Certainly, uh, you you saw it firsthand in your district in Paradise. How we uh, we need to focus first on those, but also we're way we're so far behind the curve. We need those other categorical exclusions that you mentioned, yes, uh, such as the dead trees there, and be able to remove them on landscape scale, rather than having to go. Uh, one application after the other, which all of them are subject to NEPA and litigation, and that just slows the process down. We have good work on the good neighbor policy, allowing local tribes and local governments and even neighboring private lands. I think we need a lot stronger uh, help from the private sector on this to do it faster than what we are. Let me touch real quickly. Uh, good work on getting rice into China. Uh, how's it going on uh, Japan with the discussions and getting rice uh, a little more strongly into that economy? We, uh, we don't know yet, uh, obviously. Ambassador Lighthizer uh, will focus on Japan along with China over the uh, understanding that the TPP implementations are coming and our producers will be at an extreme disadvantage there. He understands how important Japan is and has committed to me that uh, he will move on that as quickly as able with them and uh, hopefully can get a, an agreement that's TPP or better uh, very soon. <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, recognize the gentlelady from Virginia, also the new uh, subcommittee chairman of conservation and forestry, Ms. Svanberger. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Secretary Purdue. It's so nice to see you. Thank you for being here. And first of all, I'd like to start by inviting you to join me in Central Virginia. Visit my district sometime. We have bison farmers, vineyards, dairies, small and large soybean farms, hydroponic farms, uh, small family. Uh, certified naturally grown farms, and I'd love to take you on a tour of, of quite a few of our, our farms if and when you have the time. But my question today is about rural broadband. I know there's been a number of questions about this already, but according to the FCC's 2018 broadband deployment report, almost 30% of Virginians living in rural areas don't have access to fixed broadband at what's considered a minimally acceptable speed. That's uh, three megabytes per second upload. This creates significant challenges from the ability of businesses and farms to operate in these communities to the ability of our kids to do their homework. And across my district in Central Virginia, we have some students who sit in McDonald's parking lots so that they can get access to internet. And it is drastically impacting their ability to compete with other students, to have the same experience as other students in some of our more populated suburban areas that have stronger broadband internet. The FY19-2018 appropriations included $550 million for the ReConnect program, a broadband loan and grant program, and the USDA's Rural Utilities Service also has other programs to support broadband, such as the Community Connect grants and the Distant Learning and Telemedicine grants. You spoke briefly about USDA's rural broadband effort. Um, so my question is, do you think that the funding level is sufficient and the structure of the program's are appropriate to address the challenge of getting broadband to rural communities across the country and, in my case, across Central Virginia? Surely. Uh, certainly not across the country. I think it's enough to indicate that we can deploy these in a competitive way, working with private sector partners. There are three tranches of that money. There is uh, grant money, $200 million, loan grant money of, of, of $200 million, and 200 million of loan, just loan money, of which uh, uh, there has to be uh, uh, equities in there. Uh, it's only the tip of the iceberg in the beginning. Uh, you have a, a beautiful district, and I would love to come visit and tour and, uh, and, and visit with you to your farmers, but uh, the fact is, you're absolutely right, not only your district, but many of the districts of your colleagues around here have situations that ex are exacerbating the rural-urban divide. Yeah. And if we want people to live in beautiful places like you have all of your district, uh, they're not going to do it without the kind of services that are just important as electricity was in the 30s. That's right. And that's what I, I would love for this committee to be a champion to help us moonshot to cover this country from coast to coast with uh, broadband. 
Thank you, sir, and thank you very much for your comments on that. My, my district is a perfect example. We are majority suburban in population, majority rural in landmass, and that divide that you mentioned is happening right in Central Virginia in our congressional district. I have one more question about broadband, and I'm curious, what do you expect the impact of the ReConnect programs funded at the 2019 levels to be on the number of people who can access broadband? Sort of what percentage of the need do you think that that program might be able to address? Well, uh, I'm not sure I want to tell you these numbers. I don't have a specific number, but this is very broad, not nearly enough. This is, as I said, I don't know how, what quantification the tip of the iceberg is, yeah. but this is just a test case to demonstrate what we're trying to develop are public-private partnerships. The federal government, frankly, doesn't have enough money to do all this itself either. Uh, we use the REAs and all the EMCs across the country uh, in the rural electrification and tele telephony. We had uh, other private businesses there. What we're going to try to learn is how to optimize and leverage uh, federal incentives where there's not an economic reason to do this, get people who are in that business that know how to do it, and to do the most of it. I, I can't give you a specific number, but it's only a beginning. Well, thank you, and thank you for your support of these initiatives overall and for your recognition of what a significant issue this is to so many communities. Thank you, and uh, Mr. Speak Mr. Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you, General Eddie, and I want to remind members that we are recognizing people of seniority uh, order based on who was here when the gavel fell. So under that list, the next person to be recognized is Mr. Rouser from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Secretary, great to see you. Uh, we all appreciate uh, the great work that you're doing, and I just want to thank you again for uh, coming to my district a few weeks ago, and uh, it's not the first time that you have been there. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, uh, part of the draw to my district is it's been so devastated uh, by Hurricane Florence, and before that, uh, Hurricane Matthew, we've had uh, two major catastrophic uh, floods, uh, one uh, a little broader in, in scope than, and literally in depth uh, than the other. But nevertheless, both of them were very, uh, very significant. And then those that weren't flooded had so much rain that, uh, you know, basically they lost the millions of dollars that were plowed into the ground, so to speak, uh, you know, with no return. And that on top of the fact that uh, the farm economy is, has, has really been struggling the last uh, five to six years anyway for a variety of reasons. And... Um, of course, you got the AWER increase, which is a, has a big impact on our folks, and we've talked about that uh, already. I've got two things I want to focus on here at the moment, though. One is directly related to uh, the flooding, uh, and that's the role of NRCS, and I want to commend you for the work that you all have been doing there, particularly in, in eastern North Carolina, uh, but it's an, it's an area that needs a lot more focus. Uh, we have so many rivers, creeks, streams, swamps that are just gunked up with junk, uh, from years and years of uh, sediment uh, traveling, uh, traveling east and southeast into the district, uh, tree logs, uh, you name it, uh, beaver dams, uh, it, it, it is a mess. And it's going to take a long and sustained effort to clean out all these rivers, creeks, streams, and tributaries uh, to where the water can actually move uh, and uh, keep uh, so much of our farmland and, and a lot of residential property as well uh, from being flooded. And in North Carolina, we have the added um, impact, uh, and this is both good and bad, in that uh, you have such a huge influx of uh, population growth in the uh, central and western part of the state, and all that water has to go somewhere. And I, I, you probably have observed, like I have, that when they build homes these days, uh, they're a wingspan apart, literally, you know, maybe six, six feet. Well, when you have a big uh, rain shower, that water goes straight to the drain, goes straight to the river. And it won't be too long where in eastern North Carolina, when Raleigh has a uh, two or three or five inch rain, it's going to be the equivalent of a Hurricane Matthew Florence flood in eastern North Carolina because this water just has nowhere to go. Uh, so with all that said and that backdrop, uh, you know, I, I want to um, uh, make sure that we're doing everything possible at USDA and the other agencies as well to really focus on that, and I'd love to have your commitment and attention to it as we, as we move forward. Sure. I think one of the benefits of getting out and visiting with you all in your districts is that uh, what I learned when we were your constituents a few weeks ago 
was that I found that I think some of our NRCS people had misinterpreted their ability to get into some of these creeks and streams and do what needed to be done. And we, uh, we came back and rectified that by sending down clarity of what they're able to do. So I hopefully we'll have some impact over doing some of the things of clearing out these uh, results of the devastation from the hurricane. The second thing I'd like to raise with you, I'd just like to get your uh, update on where we are with the vaccine bank. Uh, that was uh, authorized and funded uh, with the Farm Bill and, and what you think the timeline for that is. We appreciate the uh, attention that Congress gave to the uh, uh, transmissible diseases. While we refer to it as vaccine bank, it's actually a broader uh, strategy than that. We call it the three legs of the stool. Uh, one is uh, really a, an awareness system working with states and then a laboratory network and then a, a real back vaccine bank. So. Uh, these transmissible diseases have kind of began with foot and mouth. African swine fever has kind of taken the attention most recently because of the news in China. Uh, but they're all devastating, and both uh, uh, either of those diseases and others could be uh, crippling to our ag economy and livestock economy in the United States, and uh, we can't be too, uh, too vigilant about that. But the money you've given, uh, Under Secretary Greg Ibaugh has a great plan for working with private industry and producers in order to develop both a network of early laboratory detection uh, as well as uh, understanding the, the network of vigilance of reporting out here and then the vaccine bank uh, as well. So uh, we're still looking and trying to determine what is the best expenditure of taxpayer money regarding the technology of vaccines in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen from New York, Mr. Delgado. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Secretary Perdue, thank you uh, uh, for being here today. Uh, as noted by the Chairman, I represent uh, New York, uh, upstate New York, New York 19, and it does come as a surprise to some folks uh, that I represent the third most rural, Demo uh, rural district uh, of any Democrat uh, in Congress uh, and the eighth most rural district of any member uh, in Congress, and I'm proud uh, to do so. Uh, it is the home of numerous uh, small family-owned uh, farms, um, thousands, uh, and many of whom are small dairy uh, operations. Uh, and this past week, I visited farmers uh, at their operations across the district. Uh, among them was Don Coger, owner of Don's Dairy Supply, uh, and Dwayne Martin, president of the Delaware County uh, farm Bureau, an owner of a small dairy operation. Uh, and these folks and others I visited with spoke about the challenges and opportunities uh, small family farm operations face today. Now, I know the Farm Bill has done some good work uh, with uh, the Margin Protection Plan, now been rebranded. I believe it's now the Dairy Margin Coverage Program. I know there's a lot of good stuff in there that hopefully gets implemented. Um, but I want to focus a little bit um, on localized infrastructure. Uh, because I think we have to think more broadly about how we allow these small localized farmers uh, to deal with the global market that sometimes is marginalizing them and pushing them out. Um, there are dairy operations in 10 of the 11 counties that I represent, and the number of dairy farmers has declined in each of these counties over the last 13 years. In some counties, we're talking about from 400 down to 100, or from 100 down to 12 over the last 20-some-odd uh, years. Uh, it's been devastating. So my question um, is, what can we do, uh, aside from the insurance program, the dairy margin program, from a localized infrastructure piece and resources piece uh, to provide the sort of local USDA personnel and technology and services in rural farm economies like the ones that I represent? Well, that's a challenge. Obviously, I think what you all have done in the Farm Bill is the best start, particularly for your smaller dairies in upstate New York. Well, it will be, be benefited by this, both on the refund of previous uh, uh, insurance premiums that under the pro prior program, that they, which they did not uh, result in any benefit that they perceived, uh, as well as the upcoming one will help a lot. You've got technologies coming like uh, uh, robotics, robotic milkers, which will help, but these are economy of scale issues that deal with all throughout the economy, not just in agriculture. And uh, the economy of scale of, uh, of a dairy industry from a small dairy is going to be extremely difficult going forward, even with a new farm bill. Uh, I don't think any of us would submit that uh, 
we're compelled to keep anyone in business if it's not profitable or, or they cannot justify that. Uh, but it is challenging. I wish there were more that we could do. And we're open to any suggestions from that and using all the tools of USDA to get that done. But uh, dairying on a small scale, a small economy of scale, is like a lot of agriculture. When I grew up, you could, uh, a man and wife could probably have uh, three or 400 acres and support a family of two, put the kids through college and do that. Now, even in row crop, non-dairy, it's up to 12 or 1,500, maybe 2,000 acres in that regard. So uh, you see not only the number of dairies going out, but the number of cows are not reducing that much. We've actually gotten uh, more productive per cow in many places in the economy of scale. So these are challenges that are, uh, are really intractable, and we look for any ideas that you may have in visiting your constituents of how we can help. Yeah, I appreciate that. I did have a, a, another question on a separate matter, but your answer um, makes me uh, think otherwise. You know, I, I would hope um, that given uh, what these communities have done for our country, uh, the rural quality of life that they provide uh, for so many uh, wonderful uh, communities everywhere, uh, that we don't allow the economies of scale, as, as you put it, uh, to deter us from doing the necessary work to think about how we can uh, do better uh, by these communities uh, and not let uh, the concentration, the monopolization of the industry um, be guided by our democratic principles. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, these communities are being left behind. And I do think it's imperative that on some level, uh, we don't just dismiss the problem as a effect of a growing economy, but that we have a responsibility at some level uh, to do the work uh, and to figure out how uh, we can help where appropriate. Thank you. We're willing to explore and implement any ideas you may have, sir. Thank you. Thank the gentleman and the uh, gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bacon, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for being, being here today and sharing with us. Uh, first, I, I regret some of the comments made on what you're trying to do with the SNAP program. I, I think they're being misconstrued. Uh, we know your goal is to set money aside to provide technical training, college training uh, for those who are able-bodied, don't have small children, uh, do not, don't have a handicap, and helping them get a high-paying job. The goal here is to break the cycle of poverty. Uh, so this is a war on poverty, not a war on the impoverished. So I just want to say I thank you for your leadership on this. I think it's needed. Uh, secondly, I wanted to follow up on the foot and mouth disease discussion, because that's one of the highest priorities uh, that I hear from our beef producers and our pork producers. And so I appreciate your comments that you made already. My question to you is, what more can Congress do to partner with you in the Department of Agriculture to make this, uh, the future of this a success? Because we want this to we want to have this vaccine bank down the road so we don't have an outbreak. Uh, when I talked to our, our cattlemen and our pork producers, a foot and mouth disease outbreak would shut down trade for five years or maybe more. And that would have a devastating impact there, but also on our corn producers and a ripple effect across the entire economy. So what more can we do to support you in this effort from Congress? Well, again, I think the initial appropriation over the vaccine bank will be a beginning as it help us to... Uh, determine the right uh, technology to use and the right product to use. Uh, I think there will probably be more appropriations needed to fund a vaccine bank. I don't know that we're able to give you the right direction to do that, but as soon as we have some direction, we would uh, recommend to you. Uh, it will probably, like most solutions here, require some more money. Again, I think just the awareness that uh, the industry and Congress has brought to this issue uh, helps everyone be vigilant about it. Uh, mm -hmm. Awareness is the first uh, uh, step in any kind of solution, and I think uh, you all, by funding it and, and putting it part of the Farm Bill, have helped to make awareness for all producers uh, uh, across the United States. Well, thank you. I, I intend to work close with uh, Mr. Eibach and your team because we want to make sure that we are ready to react and respond here to give you the tools needed to make this a success. Uh, in the end, you know, the beef industry, we're the number one exporter in Nebraska for beef of all 50 states, and this is a critical program, so I want to thank you there. Finally, I just wanted to ask a little bit about USMCA. You know, it seems to me that Congress is, we're taking some votes right now that have no chance in the Senate, no chance to become law, uh, signed by law by the President. 
But yet, I think the USMCA agreement is ready to debate, ready to vote on. Is there any other priority in Congress for the de Department of Agriculture that has a higher priority right now than getting USMCA passed, from your perspective? Maybe aside from the disaster bill that we've talked about okay. previously, I think, again, uh, uh, this uh, certainly is critical. As I've told you, I don't think we want to contemplate the consequences of non-ratification, and uh, I know that uh, we're, we're heartened by the uh, coalition that's already forming out there, very strong, Farm Bureau, uh, Chamber of Commerce, both business and uh, uh, major ag groups. There's a lot of energy and a lot of momentum there right now, so I hope we don't tarry too long in that. Uh, obviously, the trickiness of the... Uh, 232s play into that to some degree, but I'm hoping we can resolve that sooner rather than later. And what I heard you say today, and I heard previously from other leadership within the administration, that we didn't get every change that we wanted in the USMCA, you know, when compared to NAFTA. However, every change that was made was to our advantage. Absolutely. Do I have that right? Absolutely. That's. Uh, I challenge anyone to go line by line, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, and say where it's worse than it was. I don't think you'll find it. Well, in some of our counties in Nebraska, $50,000 of their income is directly related to trade with Canada and Mexico. Yeah. Uh, this is a priority, we gotta get it done. Thank you, Secretary, for uh, your answers today. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Under Secretary, Under Secretary Eyeball reminds me of that on a regular basis. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we'll now give uh, five minutes to Ms. Craig. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Perdue, for testifying this morning about the state of the rural uh, economy in particular. I'm thrilled to serve on the Ag Committee, and I'm from the great state of uh, Minnesota with uh, our chairman, Mr. Colin Peterson. And about half of my district uh, is rural in nature, so it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, Mr. Secretary, farmers throughout my district are struggling with record low farm incomes and low commodity prices. My farmers have made it clear that maintaining the farm safety net is critical to keeping their operations afloat. Thanks to the work of this committee, before I got here, the Farm Bill gives producers access to valuable risk management tools. The Farm Bill also provides producers with an opportunity to update their payment yields for the 2020 crop year and moving forward make a yearly election between ARC and PLC. So what assistance will your agency provide to producers to ensure these opportunities are used to the fullest extent? And what impact uh, in particular did the shutdown have on your ability to implement uh, these changes? I'm a freshman, I'm new here. Apparently, we've had 22 CRs uh, since 1996, and we've shut the government down 10 times. So any chance I get to put on record how bad an idea government shutdowns are on uh, everyone, I'm going to take an opportunity to do it. I hope you will. <laughs> um, you can't imagine how painful it is from an agency perspective. Um, certainly, you, uh, you talked about two provisions regarding uh, uh, updating the crop yields. Uh, what we're doing right now is uh, designing the granularity of the rules and regulations of how that will be done. You all give the intent and the will of Congress, and we, uh, uh, we go and put the rules and regulations in place. Uh, we are working feverishly to get that done as quickly as possible. Uh, it, will pro it will not be done, obviously, by the uh, planning season this year, but uh, the payment for those... Uh, programs are done in a year in arrears, and so we will have it done by the time that uh, uh, the next planning period for the 1920 crop is done in that regard, so they can update their yields at that point in time. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, and how behind did you become because of the shutdown? I, I've, I've failed to answer that part of it. Uh, it was disconcerting, but I'll tell you, uh, you may have heard or seen from some other agencies or groups uh, over threatening to be sick or be out or whatever. Uh, we had our FSIS workers, our food safety inspection workers, at every, didn't miss a beat. And uh, while they were anxious like everyone else over not receiving a paycheck, they were stalwarts in the way they did their job in that regard. We had and were able to uh, negotiate with OMB over getting critical people back into, what, into place. 
You may recall in, in your district, we were able to get our FSA workers back for a couple of days prior to the shutdown, and then we were going for three days a week after that, which was extremely helpful to take care of the business. And, uh, and we, as I mentioned earlier, we had uh, NRCS personnel who were funded helping to in those offices in that way as well. So I was very proud. These are people that are pretty dedicated to their customers. When I talk about being customer focused, they just uh, they love to hear that because that's what they want to do. So while we were behind on a few things like uh, uh, the implementation of the uh, uh, the broadband thing that got delayed a little bit and some other contracts that were not uh, uh, not essential, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, only the 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 bad memory remains. I think for the most part we've caught up. Uh, it will delay some things, the applications I said for the broadband and a couple other things, but for a few days, but we're not letting it hold us back. I've, we've kind of put a rule out within internal USDA. We're not going to use the shutdowns excuse for any kind of delay of what we have to do. Thank you for that. And uh, just one follow-up question on trade. As many of my colleagues have continued to say, we, um, we, we rely on USDA to be a voice for ag within the administration, uh, especially during this uh, self-inflicted, in my view, trade war. Uh, I worked in business for over 22 years, so I'm, I'm new to government here, but uh, it's often uh, the case that once you lose some of these big countries from a trade perspective, it's awfully hard uh, to get them back. So Chinese importers of U.S. grains uh, may look elsewhere. I know we have some soybean issues. Uh, do you believe our farmers will be able to get back these markets once we lose them? Yes, I, I had that same fear initially that you referred to. Uh, I have uh, since become much more optimistic about that, primarily because of the China discussions and the kind of numbers that we see there. Uh, while you refer to it as self-inflicted, it certainly was self-initiated. I think, again, to allow China to continue to uh, uh, build their economy on the backs of intellectual property uh, theft and cyber transfer and different things like that would have been long-term damaging to our economy. I applaud President Trump for calling the question on that, even though it, uh, it induced some short-term pain. Uh, that some remains this day. I think the market facilitation program made up for a lot of that. I hope you've heard from your rural constituents about that. And, uh, and by and large, I think that we are, uh, uh, we're going to be better off in the end, agriculture-wise and U.S. economy-wise, in order to get that done. The good question is I'm much more optimistic about regaining those markets. I know there's a fear that you lose a market and it takes a long time to get it back. While other people do look other places for a diversity of options they have, just as we look for a diversity of options in our personal shopping, uh, I think uh, the good news is the U.S. still provides the most reliable, the most abundant, the safest, the best quality food supply there is in the world. Well, Mr. Secretary for the state, uh, for the sake of our farmers, I sure hope you're right. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, Mr. Dunn, you recognize five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you, Secretary Perdue, for being here today and taking so much of your valuable time. Especially thank you for visiting my district after Hurricane Michael struck it shortly after you were there on the ground. I, I know you know the value of the losses due to that storm and that it rivals everything in 2017. Uh, you and I know that the key to standing a rural community back up after a hurricane or wildfire, is to ensure agricultural economy recovers quickly. Unfortunately, Congress so far has failed to pass a disaster supplemental program for 18. Like many issues in Washington, it's hung up on other unrelated political things, not questions of policy. Uh, what I, my question, first question to you is, how can we help you to be better equipped in the future to respond to natural disasters like this? And, and, and I know that's a long, complicated question, so you may direct your staff to respond to that, work with us, you know, as we go along down the pike. And let me say, your staff has been an absolute joy to work with after this. Well, thank you. We appreciate it, and we're proud of our staff and the, uh, uh, the re response that they give to uh, your members' questions. We know that... Uh, these are not things that you think up. They're constituent service issues, and we want to be responsive uh, to them. Uh, I think, again, uh, 
The Farm Bill does a great job in ordinary type of risks that are involved in farming uh, from a safety net perspective. No one can contemplate uh, uh, major disasters as we've seen in 17 and 18. And therefore, uh, I think, again, from Congress's ability to move very quickly from, a, uh, from an appropriation restoration thing, we will be prepared to, uh, to move very quickly, as I said. Uh, this year, having learned what we learned last year over the WHIP program, uh, we're ahead of the game in order to be able to implement that and get those resources into the pockets of your constituents that need it desperately. I look forward to working with your staff on developing more quick uh, response methods. 87% of the ag losses in Florida due to Hurricane Michael were timber. $1.3 billion worth of trees on the ground. I've spoken to constituents who've lost their entire retirement savings, which were in the form of uh, timber, uh, with the destruction of this. What can we do to help these folks? And do you believe the block grant, like what we did with citrus uh, last year, would be appropriate for timber? Uh, it's a good, great question. We, uh, we actually will have to design a program for timber. It's not been typically in a disaster uh, program because it typically hadn't suffered like uh, Hurricane Michael, the uh, swath of timber loss between the Panhandle of Florida all the way up 150 to 75 miles into inland uh, was in Alabama and Georgia was uh, uh, like nothing I've ever seen. Uh, that's not a typical crop that we think of, but it is an agricultural crop. It just has a longer growing cycle. And I think we certainly, as you indicated, uh, that was uh, many of these uh, couples 401k that they were using to, uh, uh, to uh, fund their retirement in that area. And it's, uh, we will develop, uh, I think, appropriate. You mentioned the block grant. More than likely, uh, there will be some of that uh, in there. Let me go on here. So I think appreciate your help with that. Uh, we also have a crisis in the Apalachicola Forest. Uh, so many trees are on the ground. They've been on the ground for four months. That makes them pretty much past the point of salvage. Uh, we we uh, had some categorical exclusions in the House Farm Bill language, which didn't make it in the final version that would have allowed you to, to much more rapidly uh, salvage and, and remove that debris. I want you to know that we'll work together with you to try to get that language across the finish line this session, again, because we could have salvaged a lot more trees than we did salvage. And finally, with the devastation of the, our timber crop, many of my sawmills will not have any wood that they need for decades after this. I'm going to ask you to work with our office where we can to ease the regulatory burdens and give mills sawmills access to the wood that they need to continue their timber operations. And that's just a yes. I One of the best ways we can do that is for making available uh, timber sales in our national forest. And that's what we are in the Music to my ears, Mr. Secretary. Again, let me tell you, staff's been great to work with. And I want to echo the words of uh, Mr. Crawford. You know, you are the right man in the right place at the right time. Thank you very much for all of your efforts. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Brendinsky. Dinsey, excuse me. Thank you, Madam Five Chair. Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good to see you. Uh, my district is also in upstate New York, and uh, half of the district is considered rural. As you know, rural broadband is a big issue for us in, uh, in rural areas. 80% of Americans who don't have access to high-speed internet live in rural communities. Uh, I, I do want to ask a question. Uh, because of the, the shutdown I saw on the USDA's Reconnect website that many of your webinars and other programs informing people about this funding opportunity were postponed. And in fact, on the website, no upcoming events or training programs are currently scheduled. My question is, how does USDA ensure that folks are aware of this rural broadband funding opportunity ahead of the April 29th deadline? Will you be rescheduling any of the canceled events uh, that were planned, and do you plan on hosting any in-person events? Uh, we'd love to have you back in upstate New York. Sure. The, uh, the April 29th deadline has been delayed by the, the, the month. That should be up on the website, assuming people have access to broadband. <laughs> but, uh, uh, certainly, and, and you really ought to be proud of your state. It's one of the more progressive from a state perspective over uh, promulgating broadband across the, across the state. And we look... We look we're looking for state partners like that to, uh, that have the passion for that. Many states and many governors who were in town this weekend, broadband is a huge issue for those. But regarding the program over the uh, 
reconnect. Uh, everything should be back up. We, uh, the contractors were not deemed essential, and they had to, they had to uh, uh, suspend their work, but uh, they will, uh, they're back at it now, and uh, I think all of these programs should be uh, certainly delayed not any more than the 30 days. Okay. And then also, I, you talked about our state. We've had some issues in our state in terms of oversight of some of the providers. Uh, you had talked about working with our private sector partners to uh, expand broadband into rural communities. And I know that um, in some states, in, in, like New York, we've had some issues with cable providers who have said that they were going to expand, have taken tax dollars, have said they were going to expand into certain underserved communities in rural areas. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out what is, what is USDA's role in oversight if tax dollars are going to private sector partners and they are not using that tax dollar wisely or not expanding uh, into rural communities. What oversight does USDA provide uh, ensuring that those taxpayer dollars are spent wisely? An exact concern I had uh, in going into this, that's why we've taken a, probably a long time to, uh, to develop the rules and the accountability provisions that way. I think ours will be more of a reimbursement type of uh, issue in that regard than, uh, uh, than money up front. And uh, there are, if you look at the accountability rules that are there on the website there now, I think you'll find uh, fairly good accountability that never dismisses or excuses or eliminates some degree of fraud that may be out there. But we, uh, we've got so much demand and uh, uh, out there, we think we'll be able to pick the best partners. Okay, and I, I just encourage you, you know, it look, if you're looking at this, make sure that if they're making commitments to expand into rural communities, that they actually follow through on, on their commitments to expand to X number of households that they, they promised that they were going to do. Um, I also I just want to know that we have any clawback provisions, but I'm a favor of clawback provisions as well. Me too. <laughs> uh, putting on my other hat, I also sit on the Veterans Affairs Committee, and I, I know there was a recent report from USDA about older veterans who tend to reside in, in rural communities, in rural counties, and near military bases. Uh, it notes that seniors as a whole participate in SNAP at rates much lower than the general population, only about 40% of eligible seniors participate in SNAP. So my question is, what is USDA doing proactively to ensure that older veterans and all veterans uh, who struggle with food insecurity participate in SNAP? Well, again, I think what we're doing for our veterans and uh, older veterans, we find that uh, uh, we're trying to encourage a program of mentorship. You've got aging farmers that uh, also want to mentor young people who want to get into farming. They may not have any heirs that want to carry on the farm. And uh, many times they can grow their own buyer uh, if, they, if they mentor them over a period of time. And uh, that's one of the things we're encouraging. Other than the, the regular outreach between uh, the administration, as you know, the states administer this nu uh, nutrition program. And uh, many of them have various outreach efforts there. We don't, uh, to my knowledge, have any specific uh, outreach over the nutrition program targeted to veterans or seniors. Okay. So you don't, don't work with the Department of Defense or VA on, on any of those programs? Well, we have worked with the defense and uh, over that, over the inculcation of them, primarily in the jobs. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Okay. I yield back my time, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Yields back. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you recognize for five minutes. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for being here. As I think maybe you know, I've got a real passion for expanding opportunities for uh, working uh, class folks. And in the last Farm Bill, uh, I think there were uh, 10 uh, state pilots set up regarding uh, SNAP employment and training. And I don't think a final report on those completed pilots is due until next year. So I'm not looking for a lot of depth or detail from you, but do you have any initial observations about some of the state successes we saw in those pilots? And, and if you don't have any uh, initial reactions, maybe just share with us some of your thoughts about some of the progress and successes that we can be making here in the months to come, years to come. Well, I don't unfortunately have any uh, interim type of report on that. We uh, uh, like Congress, typically deal in deadlines of uh, evaluation in that regard, and uh, frankly, have so much else to do, we don't have a, much of a chance to check on interim type of progress over these types of things. So, regrettably, I don't have much information to share with you today. 
Not a problem, Mr. Secretary. What about, uh, we've talked a fair amount about trade, and I've been encouraged by a fair amount of progress as we've talked about getting USMCA ratified, uh, as it seems like we're making headway with China. Uh, we've talked a fair amount of, uh, today about Japan. I mean, does USDA and, and other agencies, to your knowledge, have the tools that you all need to continue to expand market access, particularly for American producers? Well, we believe we do, and uh, we're using it very well. As I answered a question earlier about uh, our undersecretary for trade, uh, uh, the 14 Farm Bill uh, called for an undersecretary for trade. It had not been uh, it had not been filled until we got there. I chose uh, Ted McKinney from Indiana, a uh, former uh, director of ag agriculture there. He's uh, quite a salesman, and he has uh, well on his way to his, to his million mile status around the world, primarily focusing on new markets and uh, uh, going to places that are, have a lot of potential, like India and Malaysia and Indonesia and Philippines and Taiwan and, uh, and uh, other places around the world looking. The other thing that I think we've done, we can't do it again all that by ourselves. It takes the private sector, and we want to help them. The uh, market access program that you all fund on an ongoing basis also uh, uh, had a uh, also in the in the uh, farm uh, the mitigation program we dedicated two hundred million dollars of uh, ag trade promotion dollars that we allocated out to over fifty seven collaborators in order to develop markets in different places or go back and repair markets that felt like may have been damaged by some of that so. We're working, they've been well received, and we're working with not only regional but commodity groups in order to reach other markets. We've had a number of members ask about rural broadband, and, and prior to joining Congress, that was my career focusing on, on helping uh, communities design, build, and, and maintain great rural networks. And in the appropriations package that was passed, I guess, a few weeks ago now, I think there was $600 million of additional funding uh, for rural broadband. I mean, any observations from your perspective about what USDA may do with those dollars differently than what has been done in the recent past with Community Connect or, or other programs? Uh, I think we'll continue unless we have better ideas or new ideas regarding this additional money. My goal initially was to do so well in the initial appropriation of the 18 omnibus of the $600 million to demonstrate that we would be uh, great optimal stewards of that money in order to encourage you all to do more. We continue to, we'll continue to prosecute that uh, additional money as well in that regard and hopefully encourage the federal government as a whole to really take on rural, rural Broadband e-connectivity across the country, both urban and rural, is the real moonshot transformational uh, uh, opportunity. I believe it is. Well, and clearly, again, there's been a fair amount of interest uh, on both sides of the aisle, and and from veteran members as well as newbies. If uh, your department uh, is able to identify any particular challenges for you getting done the kind of progress that you describe, certainly let us know, and if we can help, we want to. We, we will definitely have more of those and the challenges and the impediments as we move forward in the application and the uh, judging process of uh, where we deploy those resources. Yeah, uh, excellent. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. And Madam Chair, I yield back. And Thank you, gentlemen. Your, based on your previous experience, we could use you as a consultant in that area. <laughs> well, you don't want me out digging the trench, I'll tell you that. Some things I don't do as well. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Harder, you recognize for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman, for, for yielding and Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for taking the time to be with us this morning and for being an ally to our farmers uh, and to our, our national uh, and rural economy. I've been in office for, for just a couple weeks, but I'm happy to say our offices have already been able to work together. Uh, and thank you for extending the deadline on the market facilitation program during the shutdown. Uh, farmers in my area really needed that extension, and, and you helped us get us done, and I'm, I'm, very, I'm very grateful for it. As you know, Emergency is a word that's flying around a lot nowadays in, in Washington, uh, but I think there really is an emergency, but that emergency is in rural America. Uh, an emergency in an area like the Central Valley, my home, where close to 50% of our residents are on Medicaid, uh, where a third of our jobs are connected to agriculture, and a lot of those jobs are increasingly at, at risk. 
thanks to, as you said in your testimony, the fact that farm income has dropped by 50% since 2013 uh, due to commodity prices that are tanking, uh, skyrocketing farm debt, uh, crops like fruits and, 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 and tree nuts, major exports from my district, having huge losses from, from trade, about $3 billion lost from, from trade. And when I look at this, I, I think that the last time we had a decline of net farm income to this degree was, it was during the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression, we had an enormous amount of public attention, huge efforts to fix this, uh, real mobilization and, and public action. And then I look at what we're seeing today, which is, uh, in your testimony, you said that the Ag Department is actually going to cut the President's fiscal 2020 request, is, is estimating about a 5% cut. And I see that as sort of the opposite of what we actually need to be doing in a time like this uh, that really has this moment of crisis. So uh, my question for you is, given your testimony and, and the scale of the issues that we're seeing in rural America, do you believe that we could be doing more to support our, our farmers today? Uh, Congressman, we're happy to do anything you appropriate to do that, and we'll do it uh, as efficiently and effectively as possible. I, I guess I would slightly disagree. I think we saw some areas in the early 80s uh, that were, uh, since the Depression, that were difficult in that area. The other difference is, uh, in that down 50 percent, we were coming off of career high uh, commodity and production areas in the probably the 8 to 13 area. So we, we began at a much better place. And those comparative numbers, you can do anything with statistics, those comparative numbers were sort of so were career highs that we saw in agriculture. So there's no doubt there are challenges. Uh, can we do more? I hope so. I hope we will do more. And again, working together with uh, what you all did in the Farm Bill and what you all will do in appropriations and uh, we're going to optimize our efforts as much as possible. If you see holes or gaps that we're missing, we would welcome your comments. One of the things that is, is so important in our community and has been talked a lot by a lot of the members is what's going on with, with trade and, and tariffs, especially crops are the backbone of, of our economy. And uh, I've been talking to some of my friends and, and, and hearing about what's going on and, and the impact of trade especially given the short shelf life that a lot of our crops really have and how time is of the essence in, in making business decisions. When do you expect producers in, in a district like mine will feel meaningfully, meaningful market access due to the new promotion dollars through programs uh, like MFP, MAP, and, and FMD? I'd say March 1st. No. <laughs> Perfect. I'll, I'll take it at your word. Uh, obviously, I think markets are, are, are really created slowly. I think, again, these new markets, certainly. Uh, I think, uh, frankly, it does depend on the success of the China negotiations, primarily. You know the West Coast is a huge export to Southeast Asia, and primarily that large market. But what we can do in Vietnam and in the Philippines and, uh, and Thailand and those other countries out there are also important. That's where this market facilitation program. You probably know uh, some of your producers benefited from our procurement program where we took those crops off the market to support the prices and uh, gave, uh, gave that money distributing, feeding everyone to food banks and others who uh, across the country. One last question. Uh, farmers in my community often feel ignored, uh, and I'd love you to see the impacts of what's happening in our district firsthand. Uh, can you commit to visiting my district and seeing what's actually going on with this trade war over the coming months and years? Uh, do you have a record of how many times I've been already? I, I do, but not in the last two months. <laughs> I promise you I'll be back. It's to the cornucopia of the United States. I look forward to having you. Thank you for coming. I yield back my time. Thank you, gentlemen. Yields back. Um, Mr. Baird, you are recognized. Baird. Mr. Baird, you are recognized uh, for five minutes. Turn the button on, got it. I bring you greetings from uh, myself and other Hoosier farmers. We really appreciate uh, the work that you did and the other members of this committee in order to get a farm bill finished at the, at the end of last year. That was important to adding some uh, stability to the farm community. 
so we had some way to predict what might be happening. You uh, did a great job there, and we appreciate, uh, appreciate all that work. And we're looking forward to the opportunity to uh, work with you to implement this farm bill and look for ways that we might make improvements in the future. And so, uh, Indiana, as you've been there, uh, there's almost 100,000 Hoosier jobs related to agriculture. About 84% of our land area uh, is either farmed or is in the in forests. And so uh, we produce a significant amount of corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, cattle, hogs, and poultry are extremely important. And then I don't want to forget the hardwood lumber industry as well. So we've talked about many of the issues and you've answered these questions, so I'm giving you a chance to take a breath here while I make these comments. But anyway, uh, we've talked about uh, rural broadband, we've talked about the impact of the tariffs. A lot of our soybeans are exported as well as our hogs and cattle. And so we've talked about that. Uh, the one area that we, that we might not have mentioned, and um, this doesn't necessarily come under your purview, but the rural or renewable fuels standard, when we take uh, corn, run them through an ethanol plant, and I have several of those in my district, uh, then we end up with uh, D the DDGs, and those are also a product that we can market uh, overseas, um, and it retains about 80% of the of the feed value of that corn. So I just wondered if you could give us an overview uh, of your perspective on um, the uh, uh, ethanol industry and the impact that has on the agricultural community. Sure, this was a big topic last year, obviously, for E15. And I uh, uh, appreciate, uh, again, the uh, uh, EPA Acting Administrator Wheeler and their progress over E15 year-round. Unfortunately, those uh, rules probably will not be out for the driving season, but they're committing to, uh, I think the term of art is discretionary enforcement about those folks that want to continue to sell E15 in the summer when they get the rules established. Uh, as you well know, building that market in the process of uh, creating ethanol, uh, you get a byproduct of DDGs, which is a great feed ingredient. The good news is, uh, uh, Congressman, is that uh, uh, both of those items, both ethanol and DDGs, are on the list that we're discussing with China, and, and they've got a potential. They need the ethanol, and uh, again, uh, we would be looking for them to, uh, to take uh, DDGs as well. We had been selling a... a a good number, a good amount of DDGs into China, and they stopped uh, when they started on the corn traits, and uh, hopefully we can get that restored as well, which would be great for your corn farmers in uh, Indiana and all across the West. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Van Drew, you're, well, you're recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you. Um, welcome. It's wonderful to see you here. So uh, just on, on the slightly humorous side, so I, I wanted to be on the Ag Committee, and some people were surprised because I'm from New Jersey. And they don't realize that in New Jersey, we still have a lot, it's a small state, but we have a lot of agriculture. Uh, we have cranberries, blueberries, tomatoes, peaches, lettuce, and I can name a whole bunch more. Um, and just the interesting part of this, so I had them research one the last time was somebody from New Jersey actually sat on the Agriculture Committee for the House of Representatives. Take a guess. I'm not sure there's been one. It, it, there has been one, but it's before our time, 1949. <laughs> And before that, it was 1888. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to try to do a good job here because there haven't been too many of us. See what I can do. Um, a couple of things I was thinking about, um, and, and first of all, just to mention that it really is important in New Jersey. Actually, it's the third biggest industry in the state of New Jersey. The whole southern half of it and parts of the northwest um, are involved in agriculture, um, and it really does make a difference. That's why it is the Garden State. Um, any sense of feeling how, in general, nationally we're doing, locally we're doing, whatever, with high-quality specialty crops? In other words, the organic market, um, some of these things. And that's what you see a lot of in New Jersey as well. And I just was wondering if you had thoughts on that. 
Certainly, uh, we're making a lot of progress. Obviously, those were crops that had been somewhat ignored in years past, but I think probably beginning with around the eight, 2008 Farm Bill, began to acknowledge that and pay attention. And I think we're making progress. I think this Farm Bill continues to make progress in that regard, encouraging uh, both alternative methods of growing, both uh, in, in the inside and outside, uh, farm to market type of efforts from a marketing perspective, uh, our nutrition programs encouraging uh, fresh vegetables and uh, going in both uh, uh, our, our food banks as well as our school nutrition programs. So I think we're making progress in that. The organic industry is uh, uh, probably north of a $50 billion industry now. Almost a few years ago, it was a, a strange out, you know, to hear about that. So uh, you see from the consumers making their choices in the grocery stores, uh, uh, their preferences in that regard. And uh, I think the, the USDA is supporting that uh, as we go forward. Uh, New Jersey, we were there and some beautiful, beautiful farmland there. We were on a, uh, a vegetable uh, spinach harvesting uh, farm there and watched the processing as well as the uh, harvesting, and it was, uh, it was first class. Good. Um, and I know, actually, I went to uh, Rutgers University, which was then called the part I went to, the College of Agriculture and Environmental yep. Science, and now it's the College of, I think, Environmental and Biological Sciences. But um, the land-grant programs, um, and I know that you know about them, and just ag research as well. Um, could you just give a small overview of how that's going? Um, that's probably a good news story with the collaboration of USDA in our uh, agricultural research services, the collaboration between the scientists there and the scientists in our land-grant universities, Rutgers and Cornell and others included across the uh, country. I truly believe that is the reason we are dependent upon exports today, because we can produce more than we can consume. For the last 70 years, we've had the basic research, the applied research, and the delivery system of that information through the extension services all comes from land grants. But we work hand in glove. We're, uh, uh, we work through NIFA to, uh, uh, to uh, appropriate capacity building there for extension as well as 4-H programs in that regard. Uh, so it's, a, uh, it's been a great opportunity. And uh, we consider the land grant universities and their people great partners. They are, and, and it's so important, and it really, truly does help the farmers. The farmers always, aren't always ones to say, oh, you know, I need help or whatever, but at times they do, like we all do, and I know they reach out to them, so we appreciate that. Um, last question has to do with, actually, tomatoes, which we grow a lot of and even grow much more of in Florida, and I've met with tomato growers you know, sort of up and down the East Coast over time. And they are still concerned that a lot of tomatoes are coming in from other countries, particularly Mexico, and they're taking a hit. And the reason I know about it is because some of the Florida companies also have companies or subsidiaries in New Jersey. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you, you have some, uh, co some of your companies that began in Southern Florida and come all the way up the East Coast uh, because their buyers, like the major retailers, want a... Uh, a, a good supply all year long. As you know, we go in the grocery store, and in December, where it wouldn't be normal growing season in the United States, we expect nice, fresh tomatoes there. That's what our consumers have come to expect. Uh, while the seasonal and perishable fruit provision was not finally included in the, the USMCA, uh, Ambassador Lighthizer, over trade agreements, and as you may know, the uh, the uh, Secretary of Commerce, the Department of Commerce, has just suspended this uh, tomato agreement uh, there that we had with Mexico in order to explore probably in a legal fashion or allow the industry to explore in a legal fashion uh, is there, are there un, uh, unfair subsidies being produced in Florida that would create an onslaught of, uh, of product into the U.S. that considers uh, uh, dumping in, into our, in our markets. So, Tomato growers particularly uh, are concerned about that from Florida all the way through the East Coast. So you're real aware of it and you're working on it and working through it? We're very aware of it. This really falls under the purview of the Department of Commerce and USTR. Okay. But we're advocates. Speak to them as well. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Yields back, um, Mr. Haggardon. You have five minutes, sir. And Madam Chair, thank you, and uh, Mr. Secretary. Appreciate your testimony and all that you're doing and working together to uh, sustain agriculture and our rural way of life. Very important, and you're doing a terrific job. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the most important things that we can do is keep farmers in business, especially when times are tough and when generational farmers sell out. As you know, they uh, usually sell out to bigger operators, and bigger operators are not bad folks, but it, it means fewer people working the land, holding the land, living in our small communities, going to our schools, puts enormous pressure on, on rural America. And so the things that we're trying to do here, and we appreciate uh, your efforts in implementing this five-year farm bill to make sure we can keep the farmers in business, the E15 program, excellent. Uh, can we get your assurance that you'll be working closely with your EPA uh, colleagues to uh, maybe deal with that waiver issue, which has been misused a little bit and undercut the ethanol industry? We certainly advocated very strongly about that. And uh, while no commitments, we've, uh, in the interagency process, we've made our views very well known. And uh, I feel like I've got a gentleman's understanding that that uh, will be policed in a much more uh, 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 aggressive fashion than it had been prior to that. Thank you. And in the issue, the area of trade, uh, the progress made with Mexico and Canada, uh, I certainly support that. And thank you for that. Uh, as far as the uh, EU and South Korea, that looks to be very promising. And then with China, uh, everybody gets focused on, uh, on tariffs and, and, and all of that and how we have impediments to trade. But there are some non-tariff issues that uh, China has used to use technicalities to keep our products out. It could be a GMO issue with soybeans or some sort of a, a growth uh, hormone or that type of thing with our pork. Uh, can you address any of that and the ongoing negotiations in those areas? Yes, those have been at the foundation of our, uh, our request and discussions with China as we discuss. While they want to talk about uh, uh, exciting purchase numbers, we understand, we know that in order to get there, they're going to have to address these fundamental non-tariff reforms, such as a couple that you mentioned, uh, the uh, MRLs or the levels there that occur naturally over ractopamine or hormones or other types of things, as well as uh, uh, the other types of provisions over biotechnical traits in our grains and our others. So uh, those are key issues that we've been discussing with them over what it will take to reach the levels that they committed. It doesn't do any good to put fancy numbers on a piece of paper if you don't have the commitment that these are the things we will do in order to assure that we can get the, achieve those numbers. Thank you. Um, the farmers in southern Minnesota will almost say uniformly that you can do a lot of things uh, to help us in these program areas, but if you have bad government, it's still going to run people out of business. And one of the worst areas is this overreach in regulations. Uh, the uh, onerous federal regulations in almost every sector of our economy, as you know, driving up costs, limiting business, making us less affluent, making consumers pay more. And it really affects farmers and agribusinesses, you know, transportation sector, energy sector, health care and uh, medical care. You go right down the list. I know you've worked very hard on uh, things like Waters of the United States, the Clean Power Plan to do the right thing in these areas. Uh, do you also support reforms down the line that would have the House and the Senate affirm major regulations to make sure that the, the people's body here is, uh, that the executive branch is doing the right thing? Uh, I certainly hope so. In fact, we would uh, uh, encourage you and your constituents to let us know of the impediments. When it gets to food safety, there's a zero tolerance kind of thing. But other than things like that, what are things that can make us more productive and less onerous from a federal perspective? I mean, uh, uh, you know, you have people laugh when you say, I'm from the federal government, I'm here to help you. Uh, they mostly want you to help them by leaving. But uh, the fact is, uh, if there are specific regulations, now every group I talk to, uh, you know, we serve a constituent that uh, uh, knows how to complain in a very professional way. But they need to be specific about these regulations or impediments so we can address them specifically. We feel like we're identifying many and are in the process uh, twice a year putting those on the agenda to get, get those done. 
We'll make sure we uh, follow up on that. Lastly, I used to work for a congressman named Stanglin who sat on this committee in the 1980s. And Arlen Stanglin and Charlie Stenholm, Texas, had a bipartisan bill, Work for Welfare. And it was the bill that we carried for many years before Gingrich and Clinton and the rest of them got it done. And I can tell you what you're doing in that area, trying to change these regulations so it can't be undercut, promoting self-sufficiency, uh, getting away from dependency of government, able-bodied folks getting back in the workforce. It's God's work, and thank you for what you're doing, Mr. Secretary. I support you 100%. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Ms. Schreier, you recognize for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I, I may come back to the issue of work requirements for food assistance uh, at the end if I have if I have a few minutes. But um, I, I, I'm happy to see that a lot of my colleagues are talking about trade and tariffs, and we spoke briefly this morning uh, about this. But I wanted to paint a real picture of what is going on in Washington State right now. Um, that. We are the nation's top producer of apples, pears, and cherries, and many of those are grown uh, right in my district in, in Chelan County. And our growers produce top quality fruits that are in high demand around the globe. In fact, uh, our best cherries go to China. Uh, our, our North American neighbors are really important trading partners uh, for the fruit growers that I represent, and Mexico is the top export market for apples and pears, while Canada is the number two export uh, market for, for cherries and pears and the number three for apples. And, and unfortunately, Mexico has now imposed a 20% tariff on apples uh, in response to the tariffs on aluminum and on steel. And, and this has had a significant impact on our farmers and is really jeopardizing our farmers to the point where if we lose this market uh, and others around the world, they really may never come back and, and recover that market share. Um, so I wanted to, uh, to encourage speed in eliminating these uh, Section 232 tariffs. Our, our growers are watching the USMCA uh, as it progresses, and so I was wondering, given the urgency that we're feeling in our district, if, if you could give a time frame for when we might see uh, final text for this agreement uh, and the accompanying uh, U.S. International Trade Commission impact assessments. Yeah, there are certain timelines governed by your rules of Congress over uh, when these kind of trade agreements have to be done. I'm understanding that Ambassador Lighthizer is following those uh, uh, specifically in that regard. Uh, I wish we could ratify the USMCA today. I think it will have an opportunity probably in April to do that. And uh, I hope that we can also, uh, as you indicated, uh, resolve the issue of retaliatory tariffs for all, between all three countries uh, uh, in and around that time or sooner if possible in order to uh, get back to a trade where the people in Mexico and Canada uh, can enjoy the great products from your district and uh, uh, we can once again restore the, uh, the free trade that uh, this agreement uh, indicates. Uh, thank you. And I should note, just for the record, that uh, this involves Mexico and Canada, but, but also, of course, uh, significant tariffs now at 50% uh, from China, also retaliatory. So um, trade deals are, are what we are looking for in our state. Um, since I have just a moment uh, left, I thought I would just comment about work requirements um, uh, because I have a little bit different take. One out, out of uh, six families in, in my state rely on SNAP. Um, in addition, a lot of the people who, who do are able-bodied but live in rural environments or other places where they simply cannot find employment, uh, and there's no effort in, um, in these restrictions to provide employment training or a path to employment. And so um, my fear is that what will happen with, with these uh, requirements is that ultimately what it will result in is, is more hunger, uh, not more jobs, and ultimately uh, penalize the people in our communities who can really least afford that. And so I, I will just make a plug as a pediatrician uh, and a community member and who is representing rural areas that are particularly uh, affected um, to, to not have those requirements. I appreciate your concern. There are provisions there. If there are localized regions uh, that are, are contrast or differ from the national unemployment by a certain level, then the, they would receive waivers. This is not... Uh, their limits of waivers, but the fact that states have abused the waiver process and having statewide waivers over uh, maybe one or county or more that uh, 
fall in this category. As a former governor, uh, our, our jobs were to draw down as much federal money as possible, and uh, I'm kind of on the other side now as a steward of the federal taxpayer. Uh, and I understand. I, I would just note that we're talking about hunger, and it's, it's not an abused program. I would also um, mention that it's not just in, in certain regions, but there are certain uh, demographics, um, minorities who are disproportionately hit. We know that it is harder for uh, minorities to get work, that there's discrimination in the workplace as well. And so I think that should be taken into account, that people with exact equal resumes, um, but from different, uh, different backgrounds may have different job opportunities. We'd love to have further discussion with you about that. Thank you. Thank you. The late lady yields back. Uh, Mr. Davis, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. It's great to see you again. I uh, love the discussion on, on our SNAP program, uh, but the sheer facts are right now, we have 21 million more people on SNAP benefits today than when the last time unemployment was this low. And this committee, uh, this committee tried to actually fill the gaps in workforce investment programs through the last farm bill. We weren't successful but I look forward to working with all of my colleagues uh, throughout this committee to make sure that we do something to address that the fact that we have millions of more families still on SNAP benefits while still not getting access to the training to get the jobs that are available throughout this country and in all of our districts. Um, but thank you very much for being here. Thanks for coming to my district last year and talking with my farmers. Uh, I really wanna ask you about, uh, about hemp. Uh, you know, we look forward to having the opportunity to have possibly a third rotational crop in the Midwest. And many of our local producers are interested in hemp. Um, we, we see it as a valuable opportunity for not just the Midwest, but for our economy. And I wanna know how is the department working to expeditiously implement the rules around the production, transportation, and the sale of hemp products? And when can we expect to see a rule issued? Obviously, we're proceeding very judiciously, obviously, because of the uniqueness of the crop hemp and its uh, relationship to other crops that we're not encouraging. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, it is, uh, it's complex. We're working, uh, certainly, to develop these rules. We are, uh, states are able to continue under the 2014 uh, uh, rules that were already there until we can get that. We don't believe it'll be till the 2020 planning season until we can have uh, the, the definitive uh, rules regarding hemp and uh, going forward. So there's a lot of uh, interest nationwide in here. We would love to think that uh, the potential for hemp agriculture is as great as the anticipation is, but uh, that remains to be seen. We're gonna proceed uh, uh, slowly to make sure we don't have uh, another situation where our productive farmers overcompensate and blow out a market before it can get started. Oh, you, you expect that to happen, Mr. Secretary? I'm pardon? You expect that to happen? Uh, I think our farmers are very productive. <laughs> I, you know my district, and I know you're absolutely correct. Our farmers are very productive, and, and thank you for, uh, for that. Um, any other ways that you think we and this committee can work together to help you through this process? No, again, I think passing off ideas or impediments from your constituents are always the best way. We rely on feedback, and if they don't, uh, they typically will reach out to you before we hear from them, and, uh, but uh, sometimes not necessarily we hear from them as well. But uh, if, you, uh, if you have ideas or questions from your constituents about that, pass them along, and it, it all helps us to be better. Well, hey, I appreciate that. One last question. Um, a bill was recently introduced that would direct the EPA to cancel the registration of chlorpyrifos. Clopur uh, I understand that your department does not approve these pesticide registrations, but you certainly uh, understand the importance of this tool to the ag industry. I heard from many producers regarding this issue, and I, I just wanted to give you an opportunity with the time I have to discuss the importance. It, it would be devastating in so many crops of the, uh, if the uh, crop protection chemical chlorpyrifos was uh, not uh, renewed, uh, it, would be, uh, it would be very damaging. Uh, we believe the science justifies its use 
and uh, the labeling that has been there. So uh, we would recommend and encourage EPA uh, to defend that. Uh, we are also uh, recommending that uh, the Department of Justice uh, defend any threats against that as well. Well, thank you. And one last question. The Farm Bill requires USDA to issue, issue a final rule on strengthening organic enforcement by December 2019. Can you provide an update on how USDA plans to meet this deadline? And is there any anything about the time frame that you're concerned about? I don't know that it is. We, we really have paid attention to that. Uh, that's an accountability date line uh, of strengthening. I think our uh, uh, auditing and enforcement process uh, we're aware of the sort of the counterfeit knockoff uh, of uh, imports that are not truly organic and used, and uh, I think we're on it. I think the things that we'll do uh, uh, in compliance with the Farm Bill can be met and will be met. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I now recognize the uh, gentlelady from Maine, uh, Ms. Pengree. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for... Uh, being here with us today, Mr. Purdue, it's a pleasure to see you again. And I want to add, uh, as many of my colleagues did, thank you so much for coming to visit the state of Maine. You did a wonderful job talking to people about the opioid crisis and broadband and value-added producer grants and organic vegetables and really covered the gamut in our state. And I know people appreciated it deeply, and I certainly did. So thank you. I also want to thank you for the uh, roundtable you've created on um, food waste, bipartisan work you've been doing. and. Um, that's just really helpful, recognizing the importance of dealing with food waste in our country. About 30% of the food, as we know, is wasted, and that's a huge resource that farmers produce and water loss and everything else that we want to make sure goes to hungry people and into the right places. Um, I have a couple of questions, and there's never enough time, and I just wanted to comment briefly. I know climate change has come up a little bit in this hearing, and I, I just want to make sure that as a, as a committee we don't toss this off as kind of a joke, and I know there's been some kind of joking around about are we going to have to stop eating hamburgers, or you mentioned maybe the cows are going to have to take Pepto-Bismol, and it made me think of the fact I have a few beef cows on my farm, and it's hard enough to get those guys into the trailer when they have to go to freezer camp, but if I had to give them a dose of Pepto-Bismol every morning, or my farmers did, that just would not work out. But I have been recently to UC Davis where they're doing some really interesting work on seaweed additives in the diet, which I guess reduce the amount of methanol. We think that's great because uh, uh, we produce seaweed in Maine, so it could be a good partnership for all of us. And of course, I think there's a lot of really positive things we can be doing around recognizing the role that farmers can play in climate change, sequestering carbon in the soil. Many of our conservation practices really encourage that. Pasture farming is a great way to do that. So I think we need to look at this in a positive perspective and think about how farmers can be a, a great part of the solution and we can support them in that in ways that are good for their economic output and good for... Um, our environment as well. So I think at some point we need to have a serious conversation about that just as we're having one on food waste. Well, I hope my one attempt at humor didn't uh, indicate <laughs> to you that I don't consider it very serious. And uh, I do believe that our farmers are, uh, are very much mindful of that effort and taking steps such as cover crops and many other things to do that. Lesser inputs and more outputs. I believe you do. And I, I understood the humor and I totally appreciate it. Um, but I do need to talk to you briefly about um, something that's come up a little bit. I, I am one of the people who uh, doesn't support the proposed relocation and reorganization of um, the two USDA agricultural research agencies, NIFRA and ERS. I think my concern comes from the, around the science of this, and, and I know that there are members, and uh, one of my colleagues mentioned it would be great to have it um, in her home state of Missouri, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who would like to have it moved to their home state. Um, Missouri, of course, is no closer to Maine than Washington, D.C., so we don't see that as an advantageous move. And while I don't, um, I don't disagree with the idea that reorganization is good and not everything has to be in Washington, I just think there could be negative effects. I think that um, the reorganization of ERS jeopardizes some of the scientific integrity by injecting politics into the work. And there are, have been some concerns, such as the 2019 budget proposed to cut ERS by 48%. A long-term and highly qualified administrator of ERS on the same day was um, moved as you announced that proposal. You appointed somebody as acting administrator of ERS who is not an economist. So you know there's been a little bit of mistrust and concern about this. 
And I just would like to hear your thoughts on this, and, and uh, I hope you'll continue in the dialogue of many members of Congress who do not support um, this potential move and reorganization. Well, I certainly hope we can have a dialogue, and I know it's beyond the scope of this hearing today, but I'll give you my initial reasons, and I would invite you to come and let's have a, a lengthy discussion about this so I can further uh, give you my reasons for this. You mentioned, for one, scientific integrity. Uh, on ERS and the realignment under the uh, Office of the Chief Economist. Here's the way I view it, uh, is that uh, the, uh, the Office of the Chief Economist, you may know or may not know, is a career position. It's a career person. The alignment of the Chief Economist as the scientific economist in agriculture, we feel like is a better alignment of the uh, Economic Research Service in alignment. You'll have the administrator of ERS, well, a career person, reporting to a, uh, a career person, which we think is more uh, division than reporting to a political undersecretary in REE. So uh, I, I know there's been rumors about scientific integrity. I've really been confused about it, which means that we need to have a lot of discussions. I want you to know that I, I look forward to uh, hearing and uh, hopefully persuading you all of our reasons and the benefit that we see in doing that. And I'm very serious about that. So hopefully you will uh, you will take me up on that and let's have a further discussion. Um, I'm out of time, but I absolutely will take that you up on that and I will take you up on uh, talking more uh, in depth about the role of uh, the USDA in, in helping us work on the climate change challenges. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Lady. The uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Thompson. Chairman, thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, good to see you. Thanks for your leadership. Uh, and please extend my appreciation to your staff as well. The, they're on the job and, and doing a great job. Um, not just for rural America, as we know, but uh, without a robust rural America, you know, and as I said before, every American would wake up in the cold, dark, and hungry. And so every American benefits from, from what we do and what you do. Um, I wanted to start out with uh, just talk, touching base with, uh, you know, the number one commodity of our number one industry in Pennsylvania. Our number one industry is, is agriculture. Our number one commodity is dairy. And you know the struggles here. We've had lengthy conversations <laughs> on that. Uh, the, those, uh, the fiscal demise of our dairy farms really have tracked heavily starting in about 2010. Um, when we lost an entire generation of milk drinkers. And it's really at that point, and it wasn't this committee, it was education and, and labor that um, kind of starved our kids for nutrition when it came to milk. Uh, they demonized milk fat. The science was bad then. We know that now. Um, the science is very clear today. Um, I was just talking to a friend of mine who's the president of the Pennsylvania Medical Society, and, and she, was sharing, she was sharing with me the studies of what, what it is today. And so... Um, I want to thank you also for implementing the 1% um, uh, milk fat and flavor uh, option back to our schools. Um, I think that just better serves the needs of our kids uh, from a nutrition perspective. Uh, and quite frankly, it, it, um, I think as a result of that, we're seeing the demand for, for milk uh, marginally increase. And the futures look marginally good, more that we need to do. Uh, and I'm not, I know not to ask your opinion on specific pieces of legislation, but I'm, I did want to check with you on the, the issue of where, you know, I have introduced, along with the support of these two gentlemen to my right here, uh, as uh, original co-sponsors, uh, the Whole Milk for, <coughs> for Healthy Kids. And I know you have jurisdiction over school meals uh, in terms of nutrition. And any thoughts on, uh, on that initiative? I'm not asking your opinion on this specific bill, but on on restoring an option among other options for whole milk in our schools? Well, thank you, sir. I think you probably are aware of the answer from our, our personal conversations that uh, we would be supportive of that. I think, again, when, and we'll be, we've just announced a dietary guideline panel, which I think is a very balanced panel. That's where many of these things come from. You know, you, you talk about the demonizing or, or disparaging milk or whole milk, and now it's back. You remember we went through, we went through that with eggs over cholesterol, and, and now they're okay. Uh, so we need to have the latest scientific research guide us in these areas. I think for the most part, uh, uh, I don't see uh, 
Uh, honestly, I don't believe that childhood obesity is called by, caused by drinking too much milk now. It's caused by a lot of other things that include sugars, but not, uh, not whole milk. And so uh, I would welcome uh, some guidance in that from Congress, and uh, we will be uh, certainly delighted to uh, implement those kind of rules. You're probably aware of uh, uh, the allegations and the concern when we did that, that we were trying to roll back uh, different things. We, if you look at what we did, we didn't roll back a lot. Uh, we kept, said, let's see what's working and what's not to proceed very closely. Nutrition is very important, and, uh, and feeding 30-something million school kids every day is very important, and we want to do the best we can. I, I thank you for your work in that area. The, uh, <coughs> I don't know if this was touched on. I apologize. I've had to come in and out of the hearing, but new farm bill does require USDA to calculate the price for high-quality alfalfa hay uh, as purchased by dairy farmers in the top five milk states. And to help the program accurately reflect the dairy farmer costs, USDA should begin incorporating this price point into the DMC uh, formula once it becomes available. Has USDA directed... Uh, uh, NAS to, to, being collect, to begin collecting that data yet? That, not yet. That'll be part of our implementation of the uh, Farm Bill rules that we're working on. And uh, uh, I say from my direction, not yet. That's because I'm not uh, aware that we have. But uh, much good work goes on at the department that I'm unaware of, and they may have already begun, but I'm not aware of it. One of the most important things we do, the general lady was talking, mentioned about climate change, and I think this committee takes a leading role in that because uh, we have jurisdiction really over forests. And a good healthy forest is, is the world's best carbon sinks. And we've been doing a lot of great work with the past, uh, at least past two farm bills to make sure we have healthy forests. And I was, um, you know, always looking to make sure that our National Forest Service, as it comes to our National Forest, has the uh, uh, tools to, you know, to be able to do that, to manage those forests in a healthy way, uh, to make sure we have more generations of forests. That means we're doing some timbering, uh, we're harvesting, uh, we're, you know, certainly with a sustainable growth rate. So I wanted to check, do you agree that the agency needs more tools for more proactive management of our national forests? Absolutely. And I, I, I do want to just comment right away for Ms. Pingree's sake. I think agriculture doesn't get the credit that it does for carbon capture many times, both in our forests and also our annual crops over carbon capture uh, in that way. So, uh, I think agriculture and, and the growth of plants are very, very important for, from a carbon capture perspective that usually is, I don't see included in many of the calculations of carbon footprint. I know officially we're on record now that the healthy forests are carbon neutral. That's not quite accurate. It's carbon negative with what is taken out of the air and manufacturing topsoil through those trees. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, the, see, the... Um yeah, the gentleman from California, Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, uh, Secretary Perdue. Uh, I look forward to you visiting my district, as our chairman recently did a few months back. So hopefully we could arrange something like that in the future. Um, California and the rest of the Western United States face unique farming and ranching obstacles that differ from those of the Midwestern and Southern states, specifically my district on the Central Coast, is home to diverse agriculture, ranging from strawberries to wine grapes to avocados and other specialty crops, all of which require intensive labor. Farmers in my district have reported millions of dollars in losses of crops due to labor shortages, and it is clear that the shortage of an inadequate labor force is one of the greatest challenges facing U.S. agriculture today. Our broken immigration system is at the heart of this issue, and I believe we must finally take action to legalize our existing ag workforce while implementing a viable guest worker program to provide a future flow of labor. In your testimony, you emphasize the need for farmers to have access to long-term solutions regarding a stable workforce. What are you doing as secretary to address the challenges our farmers are facing in securing a reliable workforce due to our broken immigration system? Surely. Uh, we don't have uh, priority in those areas, but one of the things we are doing is being an advocate for everyone who will listen regarding those in the, those areas that do have authority in that. 
We're working with the Department of Labor, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of State, certainly for our guest worker program to make the H-2A program more viable. We're also encouraging uh, you all in Congress and our administration to look at a comprehensive immigration bill. The first time, last time we tried to do that, I think, was pre when President Bush was here, and, uh, and we got close, but it didn't happen. Uh, I think, again, we've looked at the various components regarding border security or asylum or chain migration, all those kind of things. I think we need to put, I think there are enough equities for everyone in there. Certainly, our interest is in the ag labor issue, and uh, we've encouraged the White House as well as others to look at our immigration policy comprehensively that makes sure that we have enough workers in this country, not just in agriculture, but in other places when you have unfilled jobs that uh, need, uh, need workers, uh, certainly uh, sometimes low skill, sometimes merit-based high skill workers. So we think it's in the best interest of the United States to have a comprehensive uh, uh, legal immigration system to going forward. Thank you. Um, I think that was in 2013 when the United States Senate came up with a compromise that the House wasn't able to move forward. Um, I'm not sure if that was under Bush or Obama. It's, it's escaping well, the last, me. Last one I recall was uh, the Bush proposal, but you may be right. I'm not. You know. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. It is also clear that the need for mechanization continues to grow. In your testimony, you mentioned the Farm Bill's significant investment in USDA research. Can you please tell me how the USDA plans to ensure the prioritization of research into mechanization for labor-intensive agriculture commodities through the implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill? Well, again, that's part of the research overall that we do. As you uh, asked me to ensure that USDA does that, I think some would be concerned that uh, the appointed Secretary of Agriculture was direct, uh, directing the integrity of scientific pursuit. So we fund people out here and uh, in various land-grant universities as well as Agricultural Research Service to determine the best product of, uh, methods going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll yield my time back. Thanks, gentlemen. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Yoho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, Secretary Purdue, great to see you again. I appreciate all the hard work you've done in implementing the Farm Bill and the things you've done in the past uh, and your leadership. And I think what you've done on the SNAP program is uh, monumental, and I think it's the right thing to do. As you quoted um, um, President Roosevelt, and we saw what President Clinton did and other presidents, that is the right thing to do, and we'll support you any way we can. With that, with the technologies that we have today, and I've brought to the USDA attention, and I think you were uh, privy to these meetings, we brought people in from the Duval County Sheriff's Office where Jacksonville, Florida is, on the fraud that was being implemented in the EBT program by the vendors. Have you guys moved forward on that to make sure that has gone away? And uh, uh, we had somebody at a meeting, they said there is a minimum of a billion dollars in fraud in the EBT uh, vending the way it's done, and possibly up to four to seven billion dollars. Um, it's a constant pursuit, Congressman, and uh, certainly we're moving out. One of those areas is uh, trying to get uh, uh, the FOIA interest. If you know that when we go against a retailer who we have reason to believe that uh, is defrauding the, uh, the taxpayer in the EBT program and the food stamp program, uh, they get stayed uh, through those uh, consequences if they file a FOIA request. And uh, it's those kind of legal determinants. They're, they're certainly cottage industry attorneys who uh, take advantage of those kind of rules, and it's those kind of things that we're trying to, uh, uh, to minimize. We, uh, we believe the data collection system that uh, we're going for, the multi-state uh, uh, data right. will help us to determine if uh, people are double dipping in, in other places, but the retailer fraud uh, continues to, uh, uh, to just... Uh, be very frustrating. And well, I think it's something, you know, if we bring that person back up here again, it needs to be a full committee hearing to where 
both sides he, see this. It's not a Republican or Democratic issue. This is something that's breaking the integrity of the SNAP program as it was designed, and the people that are getting hurt are the ones that it was really designed for, so we'll let you know on that. Uh, I want to touch base on um, uh, something Rodney Davis brought up about the chlorpyrifos. Um, along with that same bill, I heard there was another one that kind of come up on uh, glyphosates to ban them for use. How detrimental would that be for um, agriculture? I think it would be uh, very consequential uh, from ag production. Uh, I hope that uh, the culture of the United States does not pursue the European model of the technology-free zone, I call it. Right. Uh, in the EU, uh, this has been a, uh, a, a help. Uh, I think if you look at the preponderance, we like to call ourselves sound science based. If we look at the sound science on this issue, it is overwhelming. Overwhelming. Overwhelming regarding the safety of glyphosate, and certainly, hopefully, we will not take uh, the tack of Europe of banning. I, I'm. I'm very concerned, Congressman, about the fear of our food and the fear mongers right. out here that talk about the, uh, the the lack of safety we have in our food supply system. Well, it's just like the argument over the GMOs. We've got a hundred Nobel laureate scientists that have said there is no human risk of that, and it's science-based versus what's on the internet. Uh, going down that with the technology as it pertains to the CRISPR nine gene technology. Um, the FDA is going to be the one making the rules on this. We want to make sure that people are moving forward. As you're well aware with dairy cows, they can do CRISPR-9 technology and give the long-haired Holstein short hair so they're more heat tolerant. Uh, they can remove the testicle genes in, in pigs, and so they can farm them out without testicles because the EU doesn't want animals, domestic animals castrated. What do we need to do on this body to help that rulemaking process, and I know that's the FDA. Uh, do you have any recommendations on that so we can move forward with the research we're doing at our land grants? You left out the dehorning that's already there at right. UC Davis as well. <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would hope that this committee would take that uh, and really move with it. As Be you proactive. It statutorily, uh, it's, uh, it has a jurisdictional issue, but in working with your colleagues and other committees, uh, uh, to, to be, for the record, CRISPR-9 technology is non-transgenic. Right. That is not taking genes from some other organization, plant, or animal, and in placing it in an animal for this fear of Frankenstein type of animal. Right. This is uh, uh, a gene uh, that's been proven in, in many species that can be effective, and uh, I would hope if we don't do this, we're going to see... United States lose its lead as far as a technology leader in agriculture, and then God help us. You're so right. Thank you, and I yield back. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen. <clears throat> uh, the uh, gentlelady from Iowa, Ms. Axey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Secretary Perdue, for being here. It's great to see you again today. Uh, I want to thank you for all you're doing for our agriculture community. As you know, Iowa is a key player, uh, not just in food and, and also in fuel and feed for our uh, cattle and pork and uh, fish, everything. So we, we're big players here, so I appreciate that. And thank you for helping to get the FSA op offices open during the shutdown. That was instrumental in helping our farmers, so I appreciate that. Um, as you're probably aware, Iowa State University, which is one of our nation's top agricultural research institutions, recently released a report showing that Iowa's entire economy has been negatively affected by the trade tariffs. And overall, as you mentioned, uh, U.S. net farm income has fallen uh, by almost 50 percent, down to $65.7 billion uh, this year, uh, down from just five years ago. Um, how close do you think the president and China are to reaching a trade deal? I know you mentioned earlier that negotiations are, I believe, done when they're done, but I have to go back to my constituents with a better answer than that. Sure. What can I tell them? Well, you can tell them that uh, you believe there are substantive, meaningful trade negotiations taking place by both sides. Uh, I think I sense that. Now, you know that I'm not at the table. Our Undersecretary of Trade, Ted McKinney, has been in the agricultural sectors. Ambassador Lighthizer and Secretary Mnuchin have been leading these principle to principle. 
But based on my observations in the Oval Office, I think there is a sincere uh, desire, really on both sides, uh, to resolve the trade disputes. Uh, as has been from the beginning, the ball is in the Chinese court. We will not have an agreement without fundamental understanding that the intellectual property transfer, illegal transfer, must stop and the enforceability provisions about that. That's for the future of the United States economy. I believe we're making progress on those fundamental structural reforms, but it is, I don't want to raise expectations either for you to go back and say, well, Purdue said we're going to have it by, you know, this time. I'd love to be able to do that. If it were in my ability, then uh, I'd give you the date and the hour, but uh, they don't give me that authority. Would it be safe to say that within this quarter, within a few months? I think um, we will know something. As you know, the latest uh, delay of these additional tariffs the president announced just this past week over a delay in that. I think, uh, uh, I believe he and the president of China, President Xi, will probably be meeting face-to-face -face again uh, before the end of March. And uh, if we're going to have a deal, uh, I think we'll have a deal uh, pretty much there at that point in time. But uh, that means when you make a deal at the principal level, there are a lot of details to work out. That's what they're trying to do ahead of time now. It's really going line by line over these various sectors, over the non-tariff trade barriers that must be corrected in order for them to, to purchase our ag products. So speaking of those details, as a matter of fact, my next question would be, what have you recommended to the president as the minimum amount of soybean sales that we can expect to see in a deal? Specifically, oh. I'm wondering, what is that floor that you're looking at? Is it 50 million metric tons? What, what, what can we plan on? Uh, I, in the spirit of negotiation, I'm not sure it's appropriate to answer that question in public uh, here today. Uh, we've got a list not only of soybeans, but also your feed grains, a couple of... Uh, products you're interested in, ethanol and uh, uh, DDGs as well, and uh, corn and uh, sorghum and other types of things, beef and poultry, a variety of things. So we're not going to enumerate uh, different levels. Again, negotiations are negotiations. What is the capacity? Uh, we've made, we've put uh, proposals on the table. China has come back with that, but it's not appropriate to do uh, uh, specific uh, digit uh, negotiations in public. All right, well, I've got 30 seconds left, so I want to just get a plug in there for E15 as well. Yeah. I appreciate what you're doing. I want to echo uh, my peers here uh, across the aisle as well uh, to say that, uh, of course, Iowa really relies on our ethanol industry. As you know, um, 2.1 million acres of harvested corn uh, goes into that. And uh, I would, you know, we know that those waivers went to extremely profitable refiners while our hardworking Iowa farmers uh, didn't get that opportunity. What can we expect in the future from you to help with that? Well, again, uh, you understand those waivers are controlled by the Environmental Protection Agency. We've advocated long and hard over the rulemaking uh, about that. We've objected in interagency transfer, in agency uh, relationships of clearance over uh, putting amounts in there for waivers in the prospective portion. Uh, I believe Administrator Wheeler, when he says that uh, you'll see a different type of enforcement going forward, and I trust him in that regard. I think he's been very supportive. He also uh, was made an attempt, I think, had the shutdown not occurred, we've been able to see the uh, E15 uh, rules before driving season. Now it won't happen, but... Uh, uh, we're encouraging them to announce uh, discretionary enforcement of that uh, soon. Well, thank you for your continued efforts, and please help us continue to put that uh, money back into our hardworking farmers across this country and not just to support very profitable companies. Thank you. Thank you, gentlelady. A uh, gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> You've been here an awful long time, so I'm going to just uh, make some very, very quick uh, remarks. I, I do think for the benefit of, of those here, I think two years ago you, you were sitting there and we were talking about uh, farm income and commodity prices and how farm income has, has dropped roughly 55 percent, which has been a tremendous uh, impact on our, on our industry. 
throughout the, throughout the nation. And of course, the only solution that we could offer up and talk about at that time is we had to renegotiate these trade deals because uh, you know we were getting taken advantage of uh, you know the, through the, the both NAFTA there was uh, some dumping issues and also um, uh, 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 in in Asia. So uh, here we are, and obviously uh, from a trade standpoint, you've addressed all of that. Uh, thank you for your hard work. I know you've been a big part of these negotiations, and you are. Uh, you know, you're the, you, you are a farmer and you're a friend of the farmer and we thank you for what you're doing in that regard. But obviously, the sooner we can get that done, uh, the better uh, uh, for our farmers because we're, in, as you know, in planting season. And uh, what I'm hearing is, hey, uh, you know, at curtain, current cotton prices, I mean, I don't know if I want to plant cotton. And so uh, they're trying to make decisions. Uh, the other thing is the disaster funding. Um, please uh, continue to, I know from your side, you, you've been down there, you've looked at it. Um, you know, we were picking 1,400 pounds an acre before the storm and after the storm, and we were lucky. We're getting 400 pounds now, <laughs> but it's still tremendous impact on our farmers, and, and, uh, and, and we were going to have a heck of a crop before that storm hit. It's just really, really a devastating uh, blow, but we've got to uh, we've got to do something there. And of course, we had the blueberry freeze that you're f familiar with, also. Uh, but with that, uh, you you know you have addressed all of these things. Uh, broadband is another one. Uh, you know, the, our rural economies uh, would really benefit, and so we need to really. And, and this body, I know, has a lot of that responsibility. But certainly, you have a big voice. Uh, and uh, and those are the the things I hear over and over again when I go back uh, into the district. Uh, uh, anything that you haven't shared with us that you'd like to share as far as uh, 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 you know wh wh where we're going and how we get there? No, I appreciate your mentioning many of those things, uh, uh, Rick, and I. I I would tell you, if, if Congress saw fit to cede the uh, power of appropriation to the USDA, we'd cure that disaster tomorrow uh, in that. I don't think that's going to happen. But uh, nonetheless, we, we're willing and able to implement as quickly as possible. Uh, they're serious issues. I mean, uh, you know, my friends, I'm agriculture. My friends are agriculture, and uh, they're pretty professional uh, uh, complainers sometimes, but it's come true on many of them, right. and it's a dangerous situation. So hopefully well, we get it rectified. Yeah, well, that's principally why we passed the legislation we did right before Christmas was to get the disaster re relief in here before we left for Christmas. And then, of course, uh, it, it didn't go anywhere, and then we had this uh, terrible government shutdown. So it's, it's, it's been a, a bit of a mess. But, uh, well, listen, uh, thank you uh, for being here this long, and uh, thank you for your service. And... Uh, uh, you're a great Georgian, one of my mentors and heroes, and I just uh, really appreciate everything you do for us. Thank you. That's an awesome responsibility. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Cox. Yes, uh, Secretary. Thanks so much uh, for staying so late and uh, sharing your time with us. Uh, your testimony might not as be as titillating as uh, some of the other hearings going on today, but I think it's much more substantive. Uh, and as you know, I, I come from the California's 21st Congressional District, which is the top agricultural district in the top agricultural state. And just last year, California became the world's fifth largest economy. And you know that's attributed to lots of things, financial services, entertainment, <coughs> technology. But left out of that story is uh, our state's uh, ag industry and our rural regions. And as you know, that our rural regions are some of the most beautiful and bountiful places in the world. They produce our uh, commodities for all of our Americans in uh, you know, food, water, and open spaces. And our farmers and ranches are the cornerstones of these economies. And when they succeed, our communities succeed. And you know, one crucial piece of the success is the USDA Rural Development Programs. And as you well know, uh, you've been there and you can attest that 
uh, our district and throughout the Central Valley, they're very rural. But the problem I keep on hearing when I talk to uh, 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 these communities is that they can't access these programs because of the myriad of definitions of what is rural uh, as defined by the USDA. And so I'd like to hear what the administration is doing to, uh, you know, to make sure that these programs, these very valuable programs, uh, are available to really our rural communities uh, so they can access this uh, federal assistance. Sure. Uh, you've, uh, you've hit on a very serious issue. Unfortunately, it's not uh, determined by USDA. It's statutorily defined in these rural definitions, and I would encourage uh, this committee to look at a common definition of rural in, that you could direct in many of our programs regarding access. We're limited to defining rural as under 20,000 in many places, under 10 in some other places. So we would love to have a common definition because uh, the rural, I mean, places that might have been 10,000 10 years ago may be 20 now, and those that might have been 20 are now 40 and 50 and still need help in their growth, many times in their growth of water, water treatment plants and others in a more definitive way. So we would love to have a comprehensive definition of rural uh, we were hoping to get that in the farm bill, and uh, that was not one of the things that we could agree upon. Well, uh, I guess that's why we were elected to Congress and why we sit on this committee. And, and certainly, uh, you know, we've talked about it a little earlier uh, and touched on it. And I just want to hit it on again, but you know, with regard to disaster relief, uh, but really we haven't spoken about the causes of the, d the disasters in the first place. And, and just once again, how does the issue of climate change affect, influence, and guide the forecasts, the policies, and programs of the Ag Department? Well, again, we're trying to do better meteorological forecast on a longer-term basis, our uh, uh, drought monitor and different things like that. Aside from causes, we are trying to uh, mitigate the effects with uh, better research of crops and seeds, as also practices regarding cover crops and things like that that have... Uh, better quality water runoff and less, uh, less carbon in, uh, footprint for more, less uh, tr trips across the field, those kind of things, and limiting that, no tilling, all those practices. I think our producers are doing a much better job. They're much more aware than they ever have been, but we can always do better. Well, thanks so much. And to, re to uh, reiterate, uh, Mr. Harders, Mr. Uh, Carver Halls, Mr. Panetas, myself, Mr. Costa's invitation, we'd uh, I sure would like to see you back in California sometime soon. Well, I'm going to come to your district. I've already been to there. <laughs> okay, thanks again, <laughs> Secretary. And I yield back the rest of my time. Thanks, gentlemen. The uh, gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. You've been patient. Yeah, you I uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, my folks back home are concerned about how the FDA is handling gene editing. I actually just walked out of an SST committee, and the folks from... I assume Oregon State or Washington State concerned about the oyster industry and gene editing. Just to be frank, uh, our livestock and poultry folks think that gene editing supervision ought to come under the uh, USDA jurisdiction. Um, and just want to know your thoughts on, on what we can do to work in that direction. Well, again, we believe certainly from an agricultural perspective, uh, uh, we could uh, implement those issues in a very safe way. I think we've demonstrated that through our food safety inspection service. Obviously, FDA has some, uh, uh, has some equities that we may not have in the beginning of the uh, science of that. But uh, I would hope that we can come to some resolution between uh, your committee and uh, the jurisdiction of the committee that has jurisdiction over FDA uh, to the, so that we do not lose out in the technological advances of CRISPR-9 non-transgenic gene editing going forward. If uh, the, we have a trade problem today because this country has led in research and development for over 70 years in better productivity. If we lose that lead internationally, uh, we are, we are at the beginning uh, going down. So uh, I'm hoping that we can resolve this. It shouldn't uh, rely upon uh, jurisdictional issues that ought to be based on science and, and moving forward because uh, 
if we take as long to approve these kind of things as if we take to improve pharmaceuticals, uh, it will be, again, located, this technology will be located outside the boundaries of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I want to talk a second about the Sale Act, the Dealer Statutory Trust. You may recall that my life, I started off working on the family farms, but my first real job uh, was, was working at a sale barn. And we, through the last farm bill, we uh, provided for you guys to study uh, this, this, the Sale Act a little bit, what, it would, what its impact would be, and just wanted to know if you have any type of update on what the timeline looks for it. You've caught me totally unawares and unbrief, Congressman. Congratulations. I apologize. So, uh, that's apologize. We will, uh, we'll answer your question uh, uh, by, uh, by a written comment later. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, so moving on uh, from my, my dairy producers, uh, obviously in the new Farm Bill, we have some new programs going on. And I'm still trying to wrap my arms around all, all of them. Uh, there's both options in FSA and RMA. What's kind of a timeline look like for going forward with that and any words of advice I can give to my producers back home? I would, uh, I would probably say you ought to encourage your wheat producers to go in the dairy business with the new farm bill. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, uh, the timelines that we talked about earlier is that uh, you remember... It has provisions for net refunds for those that have been in the prior program, a margin protection program. Those refunds we expect to be around, to begin around April the 30th uh, in that way. Uh, the paper uh, transfer of paper recording for the first two years of that program has impeded the progress of that. We could have done it sooner. The calculator of where, where we should determine ought to be out around April 15th of where they should participate. Uh, we believe uh, the uh, retroactive uh, uh, insurance participation MPP March the 18th allow farmers with insurance retroactive there. And uh, the sign up we think for the new dairy program will be around June 17th. And we think the payments initially may begin as early as July 8th. Great. Uh, speaking of wheat farmers, they're asking about uh, the sign-up for ARC and PLC, and of course they want to make sure that China's still interested in buying wheat. We got a WTO project or a case out there, year number three, China supplementing their wheat and corn farmers to the tune of $100 million per year. So maybe just talk a little bit about the uh, ARC and PLC sign-up and then the, the wheat situation in, in China. Yes, the ARC and PLC... Uh Really, the sign-up, well, we're hoping to be around September the 1st. Uh, there was an earlier statutory requirement, but that was the assumption of passing in the uh, previous fiscal year as well. We were delayed about that. I think that's about as soon as we can uh, do it. We'll complete the rule probably around the 1st of May, but then uh, by the time we get it OMB cleared, uh, whether it's significant or insignificant, it's probably going to be uh, September 1st before we get sign-up. The interesting thing, though, it... Uh, it, it'll affect the 1920 crop, not the 1819 crop, not okay. not the crop they're planting right now, but the for the next next crop year. Thank you. I yield back. Okay. Thank, gentlemen. Uh, the gentlelady from Illinois, uh, Ms. Bustos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and hello, Mr. Secretary. Hey, ma'am. You've got good stamina. <laughs> <laughs> I went and had lunch and came back and had a couple <laughs> meetings and came back, so. Um, I, I talked with you before about the Ag, ag Lab in Peoria, uh, very, very important uh, to my region. Um, we share Peoria with uh, Congressman LaHood, so we've got, as I've told you before, we have a Democrat and a Republican that represents that town, and uh, we, we work very hard together uh, to make sure that the Ag Lab is doing well. Uh, the big concern that I have is with the administration's um, thought of closing, uh, threatened twice now to close the Peoria Ag Lab. It is the largest agricultural research lab within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, we've got about 100 PhDs that walk through those doors every, every work day and 250 people total. You know, they've done things, uh, and I think you're aware of this, but they came up with the mass distribution method for penicillin. Uh, they're just on this great breakthrough that they think they have found a mosquito repellent that's more effective than DEET. You know, so we've got all these great things that are coming out of those doors. And um, I know your stated commitment to ag research, and I applaud you for that.
Just want to know what can we see going forward? Can you be on the same page with us in making sure that those doors stay open? Um, in fact, can we grow the, the presence of the PhDs that walk through those doors and do even more great work in agricultural research? Actually, we have a proposal to move them to the National Capital Region so they can be here with NIFA and ERS. No, <laughs> okay. Joke. Joke. <laughs> Joke. <laughs> Psych. <laughs> uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, probably the careers at OMB have been after these labs out here in the country for past more than the past two years. And I made, I kind of did a hissy fit last year about the need for research in agriculture over the funding that, that hopefully, uh, ARS, it's a big deal. And yes. uh, these people make uh, huge progress. I believe it is fundamentally the reason that we are so productive and have to depend on exports and trade now to be profitable because our farmers are so productive based on the basic research the applied research and the delivery system of an extension service. And we'll continue to advocate for that. I, I believe you'll see a better research budget proposal coming forward. Hopefully you will. And uh, we're going to do the best to implement that. So that'd be, that'd be I appreciate great. you being proud of those folks, and they do a great job. Yeah, very much so. Um, have you had a chance to visit that yet? The, I'm not yet. We'd love to have you. Uh, Darren and I, can we can both host you there. Okay. Uh, but we'd love to have you. I know you're probably getting 5 million invitations to go to people's districts, but I'd love to, for you to see it's this, it's this wonder, wonderful Art Deco um, era building and just the, the amazing work that comes out of that. We'd love to have you if, if you think you could fit that in your schedule at Appreciate some point. Appreciate the invitation. We try to get to our labs and our other USDA facilities that are 90% of them are out of, out of the region here, and we try to get around and encourage those folks and let them know that uh, we still know they're part of our family. Okay, well, we'll uh, we'd, we'd host you in grand fashion if you can make it. Uh, another question I have, I've been to Cuba a couple times. Um, Rodney Davis and I actually did a bipartisan ag tour of, of Cuba to look for what markets uh, we had potential to trade in for our, our producers and our growers. And um, I, I think, uh, and this was under the Obama administration, um, President Trump doesn't seem to be as open to having Cuba as a trading partner. I know we've got the, the market access program, and we've got some funding to look for expanding our, our markets. But uh, any sh thoughts you can share with us about your feelings of, of growing our relationship with Cuba and, and our ag partner, as an ag partner? I will. I've got a personal, relation, or personal response based on when I was governor, and we tried to do the same thing. I think probably eliminating or the uh, restriction over the market access program of using down there. The real issue with Cuba is just cash, yeah. and uh, they don't have the resources to uh, do that. We are already, we're still shipping poultry and rice and other things down there, but uh, uh, they could do more if, uh, if they really had the, the money. They've been supported by sponsors uh, uh, around the world in, in a way, and there's obviously conversation with Venezuela having supported their fuel and energy uh, if issues, and that's kind of certainly uh, cloudy right now. But uh, we would love to, uh, if, if, if Cuba were able to, I, I've been in the business, in business and I'd love to sell some customers, but if they couldn't pay you, uh, you, you didn't need their business. And that's kind of the problem right now with Cuba. But I think uh, we're sitting right on the doorstep ready whenever they're able to get financially able to buy our products. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Colmer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Secretary, it's always an honor to have you before our committee. I'm a big fan of yours. I speak to Farm Bureau groups and ag groups all the time, and I brag on you, and you're extremely popular within the ag community, and I appreciate the good work you're doing. I know it's been a long uh, day for you today. I just ran over here from the oversight committee hearing and I can assure you you're having a better day than the sole witness testifying before that committee is having. So uh, again, it's, it's great to have you here. I wanted to uh, talk to you about tobacco. Being from Kentucky, I probably have the biggest, if not uh, one of the biggest, uh, tobacco districts in America. And Mr. Secretary, the FDA is mounting a federal assault on tobacco growers uh, in Kentucky and throughout the South. In just two years, we have seen, in two years, we have seen more tobacco regulations out of the FDA than the entire eight years under the Obama administration. 
my biggest concern is about dark tobacco growers. As you may know, the vast majority of dark tobacco is grown within a 100-mile radius of Hopkinsville, Kentucky, right in the center of my district. The previous administration literally dropped a midnight rule related to smokeless tobacco that would wipe out the entire American moist, smokeless tobacco category and subsequently wipe out the dark tobacco growers in Kentucky. Tobacco growers are truly struggling with the FDA, with its proposals, uh, it's adding the economic challenges that they already face. Can you assure this committee that you will continue to educate Commissioner Gottlieb and the FDA on rules they have proposed which directly impact tobacco producers in Kentucky and throughout the United States? Yes. And I appreciate that. We've had this uh, conversation before. I know that uh, you support farmers, hardworking farmers. It's just uh, the nitrosamine rule is unattainable, and there's just too much uncertainty right now within the tobacco industry. There are only two types of farming in Kentucky now that a young beginning farmer can do that will cash flow, and that's tobacco and poultry. How about hemp? Uh, well, well, hemp, is, that's my next question. <laughs> I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, we uh, really excited in Kentucky. We were the first state to start uh, legally growing industrial hemp. Uh, we have probably 35 processors in the state. I know Senator McConnell has spoken to you as well on uh, his support and excitement about the hemp industry, and Rodney Davis mentioned it in his remarks. I know that uh, it's a uh, bureaucratic nightmare to come up with the rules and regulations with the new emerging industry. Uh, we had lots of uh, learning experiences in the Kentucky Department of Agriculture when we began a very, very small program. Uh, I just want to offer my assistance uh, from my experience regulating uh, a new industry, the hemp industry in Kentucky, uh, when you come to uh, trying to implement the new law. Uh, I believe that what you said is exactly uh, correct with respect to, uh, we as farmers are, do a very good job producing anything. Give us time and we can overproduce it in a, a very short period of time. So the, um, you know, the, I think there are a lot of uh, potential pitfalls out there that could probably be avoided from a regulatory standpoint. I would love to continue that discussion with you. I know we have people in the Kentucky Department of Agriculture that, that would uh, offer their assistance as well as Senator McConnell on that. The last thing I wanted to mention, and I will yield back, uh, we post all of our committee questions on, on our Facebook and my farmers call every day. I know you've answered this question a few times already today, but can you kind of give us a quick update of where we are with trade with, with China, especially with the soybean market? Sure. Uh, again, I think we're cautiously optimistic. I believe substantive progress was made over the last two weeks, the last two visits, both us there and them here. Uh, uh, and uh, But again, I, I don't want to prematurely raise expectations. There's a lot of work to be done. We've made some progress on structural reform, including intellectual property, but uh, there's more to be made. And there are hurdles here in agriculture over uh, structural non-tariff mm -hmm. barriers that, to reach the kind of numbers that mm -hmm. uh, we would want to see and they uh, would like to commit right. to. We've got to change some things, and hopefully we can see those happen. So while we want to continue to assume the best, We've got mm -hmm. to continue to work hard to make sure it happens. Well, thank you, and I'll conclude by saying this. Kentucky farmers support President Trump, and they support you, and I appreciate the good work you're doing for Kentucky agriculture. Well, we do want to rely on you and, obviously, Commissioner Quarles, uh, Secretary Quarles, over uh, the hemp issues we navigate, not only a new emerging, but a unique crop. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, gentlelady from uh, Connecticut, Hayes. Thank you, Secretary. Um, thank you for being here today. I apologize for my tardiness. I had another committee assignment. Um, but this is my first uh, committee uh, for agriculture, representing Connecticut's 5th District, and bringing forth the voices of our small family farmers and our inner city students who rely on programs like School Nutrition and SNAP. I want you to know that one in eight people in Connecticut are food insecure, about 17% or 117,000 children. And as a teacher, I know exactly how important SNAP and programs like school meals are for my 
students to succeed in the classroom. I have to add this because um, I hear a lot of talk about the economy and trade and production and budgets, but as a history teacher, I know that one of our basic functions of government as outlined in the Constitution is to promote the general welfare as well. And I hope that, I mean, I recognize as a member of this committee that those children are also our responsibility. Um, kids don't learn when they're hungry. Also, when we're talking about these programs, children can't go to job training programs. So when we're talking about able-bodied adults and SNAP programs and things like that, I, I just hope that we don't forget that most of the people who receive these benefits are children. And I appreciate the work that the department has done. Actually, I thank you. I thank you for what you did to maintain the operation of nutrition programs, including SNAP, school mills, and WIC during the partial government shutdown. Um, we've heard from school food service directors and commodity distributors that the shutdown had an impact on their ability to procure and distribute food to schools. Can you outline what impacts were experienced and the implications in the short and long term the shutdown had on nutrition programs? And what is the department doing specifically to address those impacts? Sure. Uh, I'm sure there must have been, but I, I appreciate your uh, compliments regarding that. We think probably most of those things were taken care of. We, we kind of did backflips to make sure that the, uh, that the February uh, uh, SNAP benefits were done. States participated and cooperated magnificently with us to get that done by submitting their files by January the 20th, and that enabled them to continue to do that. So that was a heroic effort with our food nutrition service people, and uh, we're very proud of that. I think we've recovered in, in most all aspects. We see WIC numbers going down, but that's simply a function of the economy as well uh, in that way. I would remind you, and I, I appreciate your passion for children, and as an educator, you understand that I was with the School Nutrition Services and it talked about feeding bodies, fueling minds, how important nutrition is for education and learning. But the ABOD is A-B-A-W-D. The W-D says, stands for without dependence. So that's a very critical function to understand. We're talking about able-bodied adults without dependence. Okay. Thank you. Um, you also outlined a plan to relocate and what I feel is disrupt disruptively restructure the economic research services under the office of the chief economist. As you know, ERS is responsible for assessing food insecurity or hunger rates in the United States. This is critical information for policymakers who oversee nutrition assistance programs. ERS also conducts research to assess how nutrition programs, like the ones I just described, are working to reduce hunger and improve the health of Americans. Relocating and restructuring the agency will have significant impacts on this important work. Did you or the department consider any of these impacts when de developing this new proposal? And what specific steps has the department taken to mitigate these impacts? We, we did try to take all those considerations into place. First of all, the work and the research that you discuss will continue to go on in that way. There will be a cadre of leadership uh, in EF, uh, NIFA and ERS to remain here uh, in a leadership perspective to, uh, to visit with Congress, to answer questions, to appear and over all of those kind of research functions. So we do not anticipate losing any of that uh, capacity from ERS nor NIFA uh, in, that, in that move. We did consider that and uh, we believe aligning the uh, ERS, Economic Research Service, under the office of the chief economist He's like the chief scientist in REE, the, the undersecretary, the political undersecretaries call the chief scientist. Well, the chief uh, economic scientist is the career person in office of the, uh, of the econ chief economist there. You will have a career person reporting to a career person there, which we think is less likely to have political influence over the outcomes or trying to cook the books, if you speak, uh, regarding the outcomes of research in that arena rather than reporting to a political undersecretary who that may have an agenda. 
Thank you. Sorry we went over the time. Please don't forget no problem. about those Thanks, children in uh, these conversations. Thank you, lady, for her questions. And last but certainly not least, uh, my good friend from California, Mr. Panetta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, uh, my position on the dais as I get to be closer to uh, the Secretary and other witnesses throughout this. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, good afternoon by now. Thank you. Uh, always good to see you. Uh, appreciate listening to you, although I got to say I was quite surprised that you actually got stumped today because I've never seen that in a question <laughs> and answer session with you. You know, I think, I think Congressman Marshall studied a long time to do that. Well, he's a doctor, and if we knew what type of doctor he was, that would make it more reasonable why he stumps us, but uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, look, I, I just uh, obviously want to say thank you for all your work, especially uh, your coordination with Ambassador Lighthizer um, uh, in dealing with the current issue uh, in regards to China, as well as the upcoming USMCA uh, deal, um, potential deal, hopefully deal. Um, I was just in a hearing this morning with Ambassador Lighthizer, and uh, we had a good discussion on that. Uh, and obviously, with some of your answers, we, we are definitely hopeful that something occurs and that there's agreement that is reached. My question, my first question, is if there is not an agreement reached anytime soon, do you see uh, additional mitigation funds? Uh, I do not, sadly. Uh, again, uh, uh, and I, again, I think that depends on uh, the outcome. I think it would be devastating to markets if we don't see uh, a success here, and uh, we don't know how badly that would be, but, uh, and we'd have to make those recommendations at that point in time. The, the motivation and, and the reason behind the mitigation payments in 2018 is that the trade disruptions began after the planning and farmers could not plan for that. So I hope that farmers will look at the, at the market signals today, make their determinations over marketing the same way they would do in any other year. Understood. Understood. Now, obviously, you know as well that uh, although farmers appreciate those types of uh, mitigation funds, uh, they're not about aid, they're about trade, they're not about short-term bailouts, they're about long-term business. Right. And with that, some of the markets uh, that they have uh, have been lost. Uh, are you coordinating with uh, Ambassador Lighthizer uh, in order to ensure that some of those markets that were lost are gained back? We're taking really the lead, I would say, in that through Undersecretary Ted McKinney and our uh, uh, Foreign Ag Service uh, people around the world. Uh, and really, we're the kind of the salespeople when it comes to the deal and the contract. Uh, USTR serves as the lawyer there to, to write the contract and bless the deal. They, and that, that's their statutory responsibility. But we're out selling everywhere. And uh, I think we can uh, recover those markets. That's why we talked about the market access program, that $200 million of the market facilitation program that goes to market access and building uh, markets in places where we haven't had markets and shoring up uh, current customers. Great, great. Thank you. Um, and quickly, I just uh, I have a, a letter here uh, dated January 25th uh, that was sent to the USDA in regards to early issuance of February 2019 SNAP benefits, your question and answers uh, that you guys send out. I was wondering if I could get this to your staff to make sure that it gets on your radar, if that's okay. We could. I think we have it. I, was there not a, a timeline of reply on that? I think that's what my staff told me, because we usually like to reply by now, but I thought there was 90 days or something, if that's the same letter I'm thinking of. Okay. I, I didn't see a timeline on this, okay. but I'll, I'll talk to you Surely. Soon after. Thank Please you. give it to me. And then also, if you could, and I will, thank you very much. Uh, I, I talk to me about, if you could, uh, how's Christy Boswell and the progress of the work that she uh, has been doing in regards to immigration? Uh, She's a star, and I think the progress we're making from a regulatory perspective with DOL and uh, DHS and state is largely due to her efforts in that and helping to guide their regulatory language. Uh, we've also committed to uh, uh, lend her to the uh, uh, White House folks to help work on the ag labor portion of a comprehensive uh, immigration proposal. And so uh, she's uh, a very much a necessary part of our operation because you've heard me say before, trade, labor, regulation, over and over any part of the country you want to go to. Yeah, great. 
and thank you, and quickly. Um, I know the Farm Bill has given you a, a new program to respond to a host of animal agriculture pest and disease outbreaks. I think the example with the exotic Newcastle outbreak and your response, USDA's response, is, is a good example of this. Uh, how's that process coming along, the flexibility, and how do you have any plans to continuing to apply it? I think that's the, the proposal dealing with the vaccine bank and Correct. the other port sources that from a lab network. It will go a long way. Uh, certainly when we get to the point of determining the right technology of vaccines, there may be no more funds needed. But uh, in working with the Department of uh, uh, Agriculture in California over this Newcastle, uh, we've got to get ahead of that. We've been uh, uh, somewhat uh, unhappy regarding the progress over mm -hmm. the backyard birds and the issue to control their movement. And uh, it's a serious issue. If it moved out of California and got across this country in our poultry industry, which is significant, it would be devastating. So we need to work uh, diligently in that together. And hopefully I've met with Secretary Ross uh, uh, recently, and hopefully we can have some uh, uh, new abilities to accomplish those things. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Okay. An absolute pleasure. Look forward to seeing you out in Central California. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Thank you gentlemen. Uh, we're going to... Wrap this up, Mr. Secretary. Are you happy with that? Do I have to? <laughs> You're having fun, huh? <clears throat> so I'm going to recognize the ranking member for a closing statement. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Your, uh, your uh, bladder stamina is uh, way impressive. Um, I want to get on the record in, that I'm in full-throated support of your efforts to uh, reform the waiver abuses that are going on with the ABOT population. Uh, many of my colleagues, either intentionally or unintentionally, conflate uh, children and disabled and elderly uh, with ABOT populations, and nothing can be further from the truth. These are able-bodied adults without dependents, and we need to continue to focus on that. The House version that uh, passed the House did address this waiver abuse, and then in, conf then in uh, conference with our colleagues across the building, the senators, uh, were both in agreement that uh, the waiver issue is being abused across this nation and needed to be reformed. They, uh, they were concerned that the House fix would offend certain sensibilities of certain uh, senators that they had and they couldn't get it passed, but that uh, maybe the best path forward was to do it by regulation and that you, in fact, have all of the authorities you need to do the, the able-bodied uh, able adult without dependents uh, rule change that you are proposing. So uh, I'm uh, hopeful that the, uh, uh, this moral hazard can be continued to be addressed. By example, today, California has a 4.2 percent unemployment rate. 55 out of 58 counties are under a work waiver. Every one of my colleagues from California mentioned the lack of labor uh, to be had in these uh, agriculture industries. So if, um, if there's jobs available, it may, it may not be the job that they necessarily want, but a job is a job. And so having these folks have the initiative to get off uh, the welfare programs and go to work uh, is particularly important. And so. Um, I'm also aware that there'll be certain groups out there that will take advantage of your ample comment period to suggest some, perhaps some changes and tightening of the way that the uh, counties are counted, the way the numbers come together, and all those kind of good things. And I hope that you guys will uh, you know, pay attention to that. But I uh, full throated support of what you're doing and look forward to getting this rule implemented and, uh, and getting this moral hazard addressed across this country. So thank you, sir. Look forward to working with you going forward. There you go back. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, I want to thank the secretary for uh, his uh, <laughs> persistence for being able to sit there this long, and uh, it's not easy at our age, Mr. Secretary, to do that, and we appreciate it. Um, uh, just last thing. I'm not sure what you're saying. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm not either. Anyway, uh, one last thing. I, when the shutdown was going on, you know, I was getting calls from my producers and my employees out there about what the heck was going on. The NRCS office would open and the FSA office wasn't. So I went and visited offices. I, you know, when I went in there when your first, that first round when you opened up for three days or whatever it was and, and um, talked to the employees and, you know, and went back when you opened up uh, full time, which by the way was controversial because they had gone out and gone on unemployment, and they finally had some money that, so they could pay their rent, and then they got called back and they're not getting paid. You know, so that wasn't, didn't go over all that good. But anyway, so I, you know, 
found out, I guess, that the uh, NRCS employees, because they're whatever they're doing, they were able to be paid somehow or another, and you, your lawyers or whoever decided the FSA people couldn't be. So out of that, I have drafted a bill which was says, and, it, and I, found, I just find it, it just got it now, and it's, it's not completely right. But what it says is that if somebody is administering a CCC mandatory program, you know, like an FSA, that they would not be laid off, that they would be paid out of the CCC, you know, for whatever length of time that shutdown happens, and then when it's over with, you'd pay them back pay the CCC back, because they get paid anyway. So, you know, I would assume something like that might be helpful to your agency. So what I'm going to do is give you this copy of what we've been working on. I'd like you to take a look at it, your lawyers, and work with us. But there's no sense in, if they're doing these uh, mandatory programs, there's no sense, in my opinion, for us to, if we have another shutdown, hopefully we won't ever have another one, but if we do, there's just no sense not to have them working, you know, and they're going to get paid anyways, you know, so I think this is a way to deal with it. So I couldn't agree more. I think, again, uh, we'd be happy to look at that, uh, see if there are any legal issues or HR issues or pay processing issues, but I think the best solution is no shutdown. Yeah, so if you guys would take a look at it and uh, have your most problematic lawyers look at it so that... Uh, we got some of them. <laughs> <laughs> they'll pass muster on it, and, uh, and hopefully we'll never have that problem again. So again, uh, thank you very much for your patience and uh, hanging in there. Uh, I think all of the members appreciated the opportunity to visit with you and, uh, and all your uh, willingness to answer their questions. And, and we look forward to working with you and uh, working through the issues that we have, getting this farm bill implemented. So thank you very thank much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Committee's adjourned.